Butt Kicker Gamer 2. What you see and what you hear is what you feel. Butt Kicker. The future is feeling. Ever witness someone so fast on track you doubt you could ever be on their level? The mission of Advanced Motorsports is to demonstrate the speed is achievable for everyone. With the expertise of some of the best sim drivers in North America, we are set to release free content on social media and comprehensive guides on our website. For those seeking the ultimate experience, our Advanced Motorsport Institute and personalized coaching sessions are the way to go. No matter your level of experience, we invite you to follow us on our social media to learn to be fast, fast. The circus has made its way to the Temple of Speed, and today with two GT3 races ahead of us, the question on everyone's mind, how much chaos into turn number one? You ask me, the answer is yes. We're ready to go, though, once again, here live on RaceBot TV. Delighted you can join us for what is bound to be an entertaining two or so hours of action here. My name's Arjuna Kenki Party, joined alongside by Dylan Cole as we get ready for all of the action, and Dylan, with a track known as the Temple of Speed, it sets, the, it sets the expectations quite high. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello, everybody watching on Race Spot TV. Arjuna, I agree with you, though. Uh, the answer, turn one, yes. Monza is so fast. There's so many. I wouldn't say necessarily difficult chicanes, but it's very easy to get overconfident and overshoot your braking marks. And uh, it's going to be fun to see if these drivers are able to handle all of the speed here today. Does not look like we're in for rain, at least just yet. I've still got my rain dance shoes going on, though. Let's see if that's what we're going to be in for. A quick look at the schedule as the drivers go for qualifying. And of course, we're already heading through the first half of the season. Next week, we'll head to the Circuit de la Sarthe for what is going to be a slipstream affair much like we'll see here today. Sebring, the Red Bull Ring, Mount Panorama, and then over to the Norschleife, of course, the week of the great 24-hour race itself. It's going to be a fun ride through the schedule. And, of course, the GT3 Fix Series, as the name implies, Fix Setups, runs the same schedule as the Sprint Series, where the open setups sometimes bring in a little bit more of the excitement. Let's talk, though, about championship standings, because, Dylan, we're now three races complete. Form book starting to be filled up, and it's Jim Feliz with two wins on the tr uh, two wins out of three, I should say. That's built up 25 points over Tyler Graf. We've got the return as well this year, 2024 season two of the AM Championship, the race within the race, and Sean Provo sits there in eighth. And let's not forget, Dylan, they are fighting for the same point on track as those Pro Championship drivers. Yeah, absolutely. And in the GT3 Fixed series, the AM drivers are classified as drivers with an I rating that is between 1,000 to 1,999, I should say. So that is what differentiates. In the Fixed series, the maximum I rating is uh, 3,000 or 2,999. Uh, from there up, 
to 2000, those are the pro drivers. What's amazing though, is when we do get to the sprint series later on, all the drivers in this race that would be eligible for that race, well, they're all in the AM class. <laughs> and we often see drivers take the setup, a step up after winning this championship into the AM championship of the sprint series. And that's where we can, of course, talk about those storylines of drivers evolving here through the Precision Racing League. Of course, we've got a team championship as well. And while it's uh, 25 points at the top of the Drivers' Championship, it's 71 points at the top of the uh, Team's Championship. Now, those haven't been updated, but it is still SRT Yellow that leads, but then SRT Grey, second. BNO Car Omania down in third position, and then the rest of the drivers uh, and teams making their way through what is now almost 100 points, splitting the front six in terms of teams. As mentioned, drivers out there on track for qualifying. Before we turn our attention to them, it's time to thank everyone that makes all of this possible. Advanced Sim Racing, owned and operated by passionate sim racers. Advanced Sim, racers, uh, Advanced sim Racing designs and builds the sturdiest and most durable aluminium profile racing simulation cockpits available in the market today. All PRO members also get a 5% discount on ASR products using the Precision 5 coupon code. Racebox offers mid and high button boxes for sim racing enthusiasts, from the casual gamer up to the most meticulous sim racing driver. Competitively priced and carefully handcrafted, our button boxes are an enjoyable addition to any sim racing setup. Visit raceboxsimracing.com and get a 5% discount using the Precision 5 coupon code. Butt Kicker products add incredible immersion and realism to every game. Feel every nuance and truly put yourself in the driver's seat. Moranis is a performance lifestyle brand motivated by motorsport and founded by professional race car driver Daniel Morad. For more information, visit moranis.com. Mr. Hedge, high racing photography. Capture your finest, proudest, or simply worst moments from your hobby in up to 8K resolution. A great addition to any sim room. And last but not least, Advanced Motorsports. Get ready to learn to be fast, fast with Advanced Motorsport. Follow them on their socials to become a better driver today. And well, I don't know how much uh, coaching can help you down into turn number one here. And by that regard as well, Dylan, I'm not sure how important this qualifying session is to trying to stay out of the trouble on the opening lap. Yeah, you're absolutely right there. The times we're seeing in qualifying, 147.7 right now. But once you're in the slipstream, there's so many straightaways here at Monza that will make the difference. Obviously, heading into turn one is what we're all going to be talking about. There will be chaos there will be contact it is hey racing's a contact sport so you better get your elbows out and get going quickly because monza is unrelenting when it comes to that uh don't let paul smith hear you say that because he very much disagrees uh -oh. with you on uh, racing being a contact sport all right especially when it comes to rally cross as it turns out there's the <laughs> second chicane can see the margin at the top 53 thousandths between jim Feliz that sits on pole and ross sortino an am driver on the outside of the front row venkata raju is just jumped up to third and then tony casello jay steffi and then the second of the am drivers jared deploy finds himself in sixth spot and because it's open qualifying session as well you do sometimes find yourself uh, playing games maybe not as many games as they play in formula one at least yeah, it's uh, not as many games, but you can uh, get some assistance, with, especially when you have your teammates or if you're just trying to hold someone up, maybe just a tiny bit, you can get some uh, assistance as you see them all coming through here, the final sector. I mean, this is such a historic racetrack, but you see how narrow it is. Uh, you can't really go more than three Ooh. wide here. Oh, boy. That's yeah. a big old smash, and I think that might... Uh have been Buck Hamilton. You can see them all just slowing down, though, allowing those on hot laps to fly on past. Not sure how many improvements we're going to find, especially when you find your provisional pole sitter, Jim Felice, dancing through the grass through the uh, middle of the two Lesmos. Two minutes 40 to go. What's the track conditions like? Are we going to end up seeing much improvement? Well, about as cool as you may expect. And with the fixed setup that these drivers all have, uh, Dylan, what they're effectively doing from the start of the qualifying session, build, uh, building up their pace, burning off fuel more importantly, so by the time they get to the end, they're ready to really push as light a car as possible. I think the biggest thing is going to be getting those tires up to temperature once we do get started in race conditions. 70 degrees Fahrenheit on the track 
it's really not that hot you know we talk about the ideal track conditions maybe a little bit warmer get the gets those tires up to temperature and we haven't really seen any pit stops uh for tires in any races so far uh this season and we don't expect it here today especially with the temperatures being where they are at but just under two minutes to go here and uh yeah, I, I don't know if anyone's got enough to fend off Jim Fleas, but I gotta say, Ross Fertino doing a very good job in the amateur class. Don't forget as well that these drivers will get the opportunity once the clock strikes zero to finish the lap that they are on. And so we'll see how they go from there. Am driver is very much filtered through the field though. So Sortino up there in second, Deploy, Provo sixth and seventh. Mackay, Walden, Hamilton, and then Costello. The rest of the AMs inside of your top 20 as plenty of your drivers actually down on pit lane. I get the sense they are probably done and dusted. So your provisional pole sitter, Feliz joined by Venkata Raju, Costello and Steffi. And now they watch on maybe nervously, Dylan, to see if anyone else can improve. Yeah, Feliz has two poles this season. You know, someone who I'm kind of uh, surprised to see sitting in 10th place right now, almost three tenths back of that provisional pole time uh, is Isaiah Osborne. He's not had the season that you'd expect him to have, especially coming off last PRL GT3 fixed series season. Uh, he's gonna have to show a little bit here today. I, I know that, you know, we, we hear that it apparently is not a contact sport, Paul, <laughs> but I think he might have to uh, get the elbows out a little bit, at least in the first opening laps to make up some positions quickly if that is where he will stay. And so drivers here starting what will be their final flying attempt. I have to hope they're not too close to the drivers in front of them as they work their way out of that first chicane on the run down into first Curva Grande. It's a full kilometer as well. So any poor exit that you get is really, really just shown off if uh, you fail to get the power down. Then in through that second section you come where it's very easy to mount yourself onto the curb and make a mistake and then through the double Lesmos. Just got to make sure you don't stray uh, stray out a little bit too wide. Here's drivers that are running to the line as Raya Osborne. Uh, Dylan mentioned him. His Audi going to be practicing a pit entry, something that they will have to do, of course, once for fuel. Not going to see a no-stopper here today. Joachim Backer going to be the first driver that we get to see. See the checkered flag, though. Now he's down in 31st, has got some improvement to try and find, and he'll improve in time, but it doesn't count. Track limits at Monza biting him out. Oh, that's unfortunate right there. As they're all ending their laps, the Parabolica is definitely one of the more iconic corners here at Monza. Easy to get the car a little bit pushed out wide, but look at this big slipstream happening right here. We'll see what the time is crossing the line. Doesn't look like there's much improvement. Yeah, I think we're at that point in the session, right, where everyone's also just been running around for 20 minutes. And so as much as there is some improvement, Felix Feliz a bit out of nowhere there with a 147.704 <laughs> to the top of the board. Wow, all right, three hundredths quicker than what Jim Feliz was able to put on. Of course, bonus points for pole position are handed out here in PRL series. So, uh, hey, so far it looks like Felix Feliz is the Feliz that's going to be on top of the board. And important as well that you'll control the tempo down onto the brakes for the opening corner to see if anyone else is going to run their way to the line or if they're going to find themselves Ducking down to pin entry, Jeff Carollo at the front of a three-car train. He does not find himself uh, jumping up from 10th, but uh, no one behind him uses a draft at good effect either. So that is going to be qualifying session. Basically done and dusted because Nicholas Johnson not trending for an improvement. And so, one second, Dylan, split 40 GT3 machines. That's absolutely exciting if that's the prospects of how close this field will be once we do get going here in just a couple minutes time. You know, I know Felix Feliz is going to be the Feliz starting on the pole, but I wonder which side you'd want to be starting on. Obviously, going to have that inside track into the first chicane. It's just, ugh, I don't know if there's really any answer there. Remember, we have 35 minutes for these drivers. It's 40 minutes of racing for the GT3 Sprint. And while I was hoping for a bit of a rain dance to give us some changeable conditions, I think we're going to be in for a rather intriguing affair. How much is fuel saving going to come into the mix? Well, 
going to have to wait to find out. Drivers will get their instructions to roll trackside to wait for their formation lap. And we'll have plenty of time to run you down through the full complement of GT3 cars that get ready to rumble here at the Temple of Speed. Out of nowhere to the top, Felix Feliz gets ready to lead us to the green with a 147.704. Championship leader Jim Feliz deprived of yet another pole alongside and just by three hundredths of a second. The best of the Ams, Ross Sortino up there alongside Treas Venkataraju on row two, while Tony Costello is alongside his SRTE Grey teammate Jay Steffi, although one in an Audi, one in a Porsche. Seventh will roll the way of Jared Deploy. It's SRT Blue all on row four with Sean Provost for company as the Ams make themselves known. Tyler Graff with some work to do to fight his way to the front. He's got Jeff Carollo at uh, previous champion in this series alongside is Ryan Osborne and then Evan Mackay 11th and 12th positions as we begin to find ourselves around three tenths off of pole. Kern de Gaal, Andrew Trickett and then Colin McKenzie and Waldo Wardland roll through your top uh, eight rows with Dale Peterson and then Brett Thurman 17th and 18th positions. 19th for Buck Hamilton, 20th for Joey Costello with Jared Keane, William Fenson, Carlos Ocano and then Pete Mejia through your top 24 and look how much work some of these pros have to do Remember, they fight with the Ams for points out on track. Sully Saad, Andrew Venaro, Christopher Rhines, Matt Hilton, and then Alex Wright, David Morse. Still, with only a three-quarter of a, a second splitting your top 30, you then roll to find Joachim Backer, David Bush, Nathan Jennings, uh, Lucas Nguyen, uh, Nicholas Johnson, Francis Perron, and then, still going... Michael Fowler, Frank Pisano, uh, Ryan Chandler, John Jones, Creighton Carter, Mark Kalin, and then we can almost breathe. Ian Cabana, Reagan Chandler, Dave Peterson, Kevin Burquist, Quincy Carter, Scott Jeffries, <sighs> Robert Jeffries, <laughs> Travis Pruitt, and then Patrick Cowgill. 51 GT3 cars. What a field we've got in store for us, and they're already ready to go. Dylan, what's in store for us here in your mind? I mean, obviously chaos, but I don't think we're going to see much bigger leads than within a second or two, unless the Felizes are able to get way out in front and stay there. Oh, I can already tell with the amount of cars we've got, our frames <laughs> are going to struggle. I can only imagine what would happen if we had a, a bit of rain. How much chaos into turn one, Dylan? Final question before we get ready to go. Yes. Yes? Oh, I love the answer. Oh, the Temple of Speed always treats some well. The question is, how will it treat the drivers down into turn number one? 51 drivers in this GT3 Fix Series ready to rumble. And after storming to the front in qualifying, it's Felix Feliz that crosses the line and gets us racing. Look at the chaos and carnage behind. And I'm not quite sure what has happened, but Jim Feliz has not taken to the start championship storylines already as onto the brakes we come for the very first time side by side for second and look at the confidence from Ross Sortino bullies Venkataraju out of second as they now cycle on the run towards Curva Grande one car already pointed the wrong direction out of that turn one complex but it's down and out of the top 20. Oh, that was such a crazy start for Felix Feliz because Jim Feliz was not competing against him at the start there. Felix was almost given a free pass into that first chicane, and now it's up to him to try and scoot away from Ross Sortino, who leads in the AM class. And that second chicane, one where track limits can be so vital, A, because gravel's on one side, a slowdown's on the other. Then you head off to the second, uh, first and second Lesmos, where it's then a climb up the hill and towards Ascari, and Sortino Ooh. off wide you can see how much he's pushing it's going to bring those behind a little bit closer allow Felix Feliz to try and break away magic number around 1.4 seconds or so Dylan to try and break that magic draft well it is almost that gap for Felix Feliz over Ross Sortino Ross obviously making the mistake there through the second Lesmo and Venka Taraju is right there on Sortino so he's going to have his hands full it's a great golden opportunity for Felix Feliz he's never won it's his third pole this is as well where because some behind may be thinking about fuel saving do some try and now just scamper away. Another slight wide line from Sortino as they exit out of that final corner. 
Lap one about to be in the books of an estimated 19 or 20. It's a great day for racing for these drivers. No rain to think about. And I think that's for the most part helped us because only Matt Hilton's headed back to the pit lane. Everyone else got through turn one safely. And as Ross Sortino defends from Venga to Raju, breaking away for the hills, that gap's going to continue building as they're almost playing bumper cars behind. Yeah, this is huge for Felix Feliz in the Porsche. They just continue to move away. However, that gap did come down by a few tenths right there through that first chicane, which is surprising. It really didn't come down all too much uh, down the main straightaway with the slipstream. But look at that. It's under seven tenths going into these uh, corners, these chicanes. Of course, we come to first Lesmo, second Lesmo. It's really difficult to get the traction down. And because we're racing through the morning as well, expect temperatures to rise, albeit slightly. So drivers do need to keep an eye on their tires, especially here in iRacing, of course, where sliding a bit too much can really cost you. They are fighting, though, hammer and tongs behind this. All outside of the top 30, if you can believe it. On the outside is that Ferrari, the 21 SRT machine of David Morse, who's now going to get freight train three wide out of Lesmo 2 on the run towards Ascari. Oh, that's not going to be the move. They don't want to be side by side at all when they're going through Ascari, but they are too wide, almost two by two. A big run going on the outside here, but who's going to break first? Oh, this isn't going to work out that well. This is great stuff, though. This is what the PRL uh, GT3 Series is all about. Now the Crikey Esports machine of Ian Cabana slightly escorted wide, but all's fair in love and war. They get away with that as they cycle back towards the final corner. I mean, the amount of racing is great. It's just a shame it's not up towards the very front of the field. This 18th position where we're side by side and losing track of those in front is William Fenton on the outside of Dale Peterson. This is Ferrari versus Audi. Now the prancing horse trying to stretch its legs, but not three wide. Buck Hamilton gets the door slam shut on him. Yeah, that was a daring block right there. It was clean. It was that one move you're given, but it getting a little bit squirrely, trying to get the power down on the exit of that first chicane. All is good for now. By the way, don't look now, but the gap up front, it's down to a tenth and a half. Yeah, I was hoping that we were going to be able to have a fight. And Ross Sortino, who in some ways, I'll just say this out loud, but we've seen him be at the front of these series in the past. He uh, might, in I rating, slot into the AMs, but uh, in ability, we know he can fight up there towards the front. Now, poor Jared Deploy, he's had a slowdown and he's feeling the pain, has lost three positions so far, and his Audi might finally be able to get back up to speed. Ross Sortino, though, has just done the same thing, I think, because he's now losing ground as Venka Taraju, as well as Steffi slide on through. Oh, that's a big mistake right there, leading to almost two and a half seconds of lost time for Ross Sortino. But Venka Taraju has tried to, uh, or is now in second place, Steffi chasing him. Again, Felix Feliz has been given another mulligan here to try and get away. We were talking 1.4 seconds, Arjuna. It's 1.8 now. This is great. I'm loving it. And we're at that point where you at sometimes assume that things are going to calm down. But no, Trickett and Thurman still neck and neck into the final corner. And this is where sometimes you just give up on entry, set something up on exit, and Bad Santa slides on forward, but job's not going to be done just yet. Draft has been broken up front, by the way. Now that Sortino has dropped back, it's 1.8 seconds. Does Steffi want to make a move here? No, I think he lifts off momentarily and slides Ooh. back into line. My goodness, you saw the dirt pick up under braking right there for Jay Steffi, who gets a little bit of a shove from Ross Sortino, who is cut back up to this second and third place fight on the podium. I mean, this fight is certainly not over, but Felix Feliz, I'm surprised still that even with the traffic that Veka Taraju, Steffi, Sortino, all of them are fighting within, that Feliz really isn't taking full advantage of it. Got aided by that slowdown for Sortino, but only gained a couple tenths on that last lap. I can tell you, by the way, the forecast for the Sprint Series drivers is a little bit more uh, changeable. We'll leave it at that and stick around because that is all yet to come. This, though, is a look at what happened at the start where they play ping pong slightly further behind. It's uh, suboptimal, as Lewis McLeod would say, but ultimately only one car really pays the price. As mentioned, Matt Hilton was uh, headed down to pit lane in the lap since then, though. Kevin Burquist has joined him. I think there's been a couple more incidents out on track. Yeah, absolutely. There have been some more incidents out on track, but 
I don't think they're going to die down anytime soon here at Monza. That gap, oh goodness, again, going off track a little bit, coming out of a scar. You see the cars just bouncing. Here's a replay. That's a big incident between four cars there heading towards a scar. Uh, oh, man. I think you're going to see just concertina and, well, one car missing the braking zone. One car also slowing down very, very early. Couldn't quite figure out who it was, but Scott Jeffries, Frank Pisano, Quincy Carter, as well as maybe Patrick Cowgill all getting involved there. Not pretty, to say the least. Yeah, not pretty at all. I mean, it, you expect it, right? We were talking a bit earlier about the narrowness of this racing surface. You know, it's a fast track, but you really can't go more than three wide at any point here. And even if you go three wide, you're kind of testing fate, especially at that straightaway that goes underneath that bridge and uh, through the tunnel heading to Ascari. Brett Thurman on the outside through Curva Grande which is a much longer way to bring your speed around and so I think he's just going to end up losing out and Andrew exactly. Trickett holds on to the position. So 10 minutes or so into this race and I have the feeling that we probably could have looked at a lot more of the RaceBot TV replay machine. Here's another look at uh, a move down into the final corner. Ooh, ooh, that's Brash. That's uh, Mark Halen. Brash would describe him quite well, I think, there. And ooh, another car hits the wall as a result. Mike Tabini and Cabana. Yeah, I believe that is Cabana. And uh, unfortunate because Kalen was the one that kind of got the worst of it at the beginning before Cabana hit that inside barrier. Here's another replay here. And you start breaking in the grass. And, oh, it wasn't even him that was at fault there. <laughs> that's a... It seemed like there was two different things. One was yeah. Nicholas Johnson that we saw, and then maybe something in front, and maybe someone grabbed the uh, internet cable and was able to disconnect in time. <laughs> End result, though, 51 started. We are still left with 46 left on the lead lap, which is not a bad mark by any means. There's a couple of moves through the top 20, but really nothing major, at least just yet. Uh, you would traditionally be talking, you know, about movers and shakers, but I think the interesting thing to really think about, right, is pros and ams. They're fighting for points on track together, and now Ross Sortino finds himself behind. Sean Provo is still in front, though, of Jared Deploy. Yeah, that is something interesting to kind of take note of. There is a three-car AM battle. The top three overall are in the Pro Series, or the Pro Class, and the next three are in the AM Class. Jared Deploy is right within the slipstream of Sortino, who is in the slipstream of Provost. And uh, it's looking like we have a solid battle for uh, point situations here. Of course, they all... Oh, that's a really deep dive in by Deploy. He's going to lose a lot of time there, but... He's going to lose a position, too. Yeah, it's uh, one of those corners you just can't afford the mistake. And now Tony Costello joins the fun. Tyler Graf in what is a very colorful Madworks entry. Might be a new livery. He's defending from Curran de Gaulle, who's in that Lamborghini and trying to fend it up the inside through Lesmo, too. But no dice, and they will cycle off with Azraya Osborne hunting them down in the Audi, which roars itself on the run towards that uphill braking zone. Let gravity work in your favor as well. It it's a deceptively simple track, and I think a lot of the ways where the, the, the difficulty comes here is A, because you've got so little downforce, because you're trying to make your car, you know, a rocket ship in a straight line. The other thing is, over the course of time, Dylan, this track has gotten very, very bumpy, and into turn one in particular, on the left side where everyone's trying to break and maximize the corner entry, it's actually at its worst. I actually don't even think it's just that. I also think you have to remember all the, the gravel runoffs, uh, the grass being legitimately, there's no tarmac, except obviously you're seeing some tarmac right there around the Parabolica, but uh, there's a lot of grass on the uh, extreme extents of the racing surface. So if you dip your tires there under braking, that's obviously going to cause an issue. The other thing, Arjuna, the sausage curves. Look at that. If you try and cut the corner even just a tiny bit, it's going to unsettle the car. You're going to get no power down once you try and accelerate because there's a lot of slower corners. And if you don't have any traction, well, you're going to lose out big time come the next chicane. And big time loss as well for those in the hunt to try and fight for the lead because Felix Feliz almost two and a half seconds clear and now Ross Sortino fighting with Sean Provost. One car not going to slow it down in time and bouncing over the curves goes the Lamborghini. Sean Provost down to fifth overall. He won't have a slowdown. That could have been a lot more treacherous. 
Yeah, absolutely, and I wonder if there's any damage to the underbody of that Lamborghini because, goodness me, that was a violent-looking jump over the sausage curb, and, uh, hey, you speak about it, it comes into play. I just wonder as well if that's the indication of how these drivers think that with your leader having broken away, can Jay Steffi now try and build some separation in these packs now behind? running back up towards Ascari. It is a quite cool day in many ways, ideal for the racing. Mostly cloudy for them, only uh, mostly cloudy. And again, just a foreshadowing. Rain on the forecast, Dylan, for the Sprint Series drivers. Oh my goodness. You know, I have uh, yet to commentate a rain race. I am so ready if that's the case. Really? Yes, really, really. <laughs> It's gonna be fun. Uh, fingers oh, crossed as well. Like it doesn't. Hopefully, it doesn't rain through Don't qualifying. Don't get me too excited. And then you know, dry up for the race start because that. I mean, you know. Stab us in the back eye racing. Just don't do I've that to us, please. enough Formula One races where rain is in the forecast and then all of a sudden it's a bright and sunny day. <laughs> yes, no, exactly. And I wonder if we are going to end up seeing uh, that Ford GT uh, have its day in the rain. Uh, I think the answer to that, though, is no. Let's go back through the field, though, to where there is a bit of fighting and bouncing through turn one. There's a Porsche that's taken to the inside. William Fenson's now bouncing on the gravel. Something wrong happens here. And big, big consequences. Alex Wright's as well just gone around. Chaos here at turn one. My goodness, it's like they all forgot how to take that first chicane. I mean, we are starting to reach the end of this first stint where they will go into the pits. Uh, at some point, I would assume in the second half of this race, as we see a good side-by-side -side battle heading to the braking markers. Who's going to break first? I mean, the inside positioning is not always the best one there. And the 72 machine does decide to be the last of the late breakers. Keeps that spot there. Oh, what's happened up front? We have now uh, Peloton. That's now being dropped by a bit of a breakaway. So your leader, Steffi Venkataraju, and then all of this behind. Provo's up to fourth. Costello in front of Deploy and Sortino. Oh, they're all trying to lose each other time. This is the joy of Monza. If you fight, it's great racing. Costs you a bunch of time, though. I mean, absolutely, that is the case. Felix Feliz now 2.9 seconds in front of the rest of the pack as we catch a replay here, heading into that first chicane. This was that incident earlier, just a little bit too heavy on the brakes, tries to take avoiding action, hit a Porsche there, went into the gravel trap, and, uh, you know, that's uh, actually interesting. He just went straight into the gravel trap and didn't really try and turn left to get back onto the track. Here's another try into this first chicane. Oh, man. There's a couple of them, a couple of looks being sent and aggressive defense. Kern de Gaal's really having to go to the inside because Jeff Carollo does not want to give up the ghost. Bullies him into the gravel and then watch on the inside as Raya Osborne with the foresight gets the drive out of that first chicane, but now left the long way around. This is where you almost NASCAR style side draft the car alongside you. Slow it down by using the aerodynamic forces. Gives yourself the inside into that second chicane where because the curbs are so high, oh, you can make it work, but Carollo confident under the brakes and holds on to the spot. I feel like you're always going to get the advantage there. If you're trying to make the move on the outside into that chicane, you just have a lot more power to get that car turned around and then moving back in the right direction uh, coming out of that corner. It's uh, been one of those days so far where usually we'd be jumping around with drivers' webcams and all of that sh sh fun stuff, but too much stuff been going on this is Tyler Graf's look not just at the face and an interesting perspective behind the wheel but also at the hands at work as well as he flies the car through as Scari and just watch in these GT3 cars Dylan how smooth you have to try and be trying to manage the tires underneath you yeah it's all about that and we get the cool look on board is that scratch from Ice Age very well could be I believe it is it's hidden by a fan. It is. It, uh, it is. <laughs> it's turned on as well. That fan is definitely working. I had to. Oh, here we go. Pit stop, early pit stops as well. So we'll stop doing our driver watch and instead we'll focus on, well, I guess because you're spending so much time full chat, early pit stops aren't necessarily a surprise. So Sortino, Deploy, Graf, Costello, Ocano, Thurman, at least six cars into pit lane. 
And, you know, I am surprised about this. Although you will be using a lot more fuel at Monza in these laps compared to maybe another track where there's more braking and uh, it's not necessarily regenerative at all. It's not a hybrid machine, but what it will definitely do is uh, use... You're on the throttle for, what, 95% of the lap? Full throttle, so that's going to be more detrimental, especially when you're not on the slipstream. And you can see these drivers at the top of your screen exiting pit lane. Jared deploy in front of Ross Sortino, so a bit of a jump there, and they're fighting hard as well. Track map on the bottom right will give you the picture for where they are in comparison to your race leader, Felix Feliz, who's heading up to Ascari and getting ready, you'd think, to probably come down to pit lane, if not this time by, the next time by. There's some clean air, there's some moves being made, but all this probably not exactly what they want to see in front. Oh, what is even going on in front of them? Donuts. That's a broken car doing donuts. <laughs> Alex Wright's right. lunatic racing car, I think that is. Fits the name. Oh, yeah, well, indeed. I think that's going to have to be a couple of looks at the replay in a few moments' time. Do our leaders hold to driver's right and enter into pit lane? Felix Feliz seems like he's going to stay out there for one more lap. And I'm surprised he's able to stay out for as long as he has been able to stay out. As you see, more drivers coming into the pits from that lead group. Tony Costello, one of them. It looks like Isaiah Osborne as well, and Andrew Trickett. So still more drivers to come in from the top runners in this race. And uh, it's just going to be for fuel. Fuel only, as little of it as possible as well. Where are the drivers that have already come down pit lane? Well... In towards that final corner as well. Whoa, 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 whoa. Up in the jacks. Now that seems against the run book for yep. Tony Costello. But he's going to drop and roll 14.9 seconds. So not going to cost him time. Maybe costs us a bit of our sanity and not knowing whether tires were the right call or not. He's going to blend onto the right side of the racetrack and then jink to the left as he gets onto the brakes. He'll be in front, though, of Ross Sortino. It's only by a small margin. Well, I'll tell you this, uh, I will not put money on it being the right move. If we look at time in clean air, Felix Feliz, for example, 11 laps on uh, this stint for him. His last lap was only three tenths slower than his best overall lap. The temperatures are cool enough where the tires aren't going to be bleeding off that much. I think that's a mistake. Well, we're going to find out and uh, find out pretty quickly. Here's a look at the replay machine, which, oh, it's clumsy. Naughty. Clumsy is an understatement, and that's Lucas Nguyen, who's going to have to probably go through the Precision Racing League driver review standard system, whatever it's called, and uh, penalties heading in his direction. There is plenty to think about after these races are still done, especially with knowing that there are 50-plus cars going to be entering these races. Entering pit lane comes our race leader. Three and a half seconds clear. Now Venka to Raju. Look at that aggression around wow. the outside. Makes the pass on pit entry. Did he get it slowed down enough? That's the question. If he did, oh, oh you look at there's big contact in the back. Was that McCain de Gaulle? It was Carollo and de Gaulle, but it was Porsche and Lamborghini. You weren't half wrong with the guess, but chaos on entry. Wow, this has been bonkers. And we knew with 50 cars it would be special. We didn't quite know what to expect. Felix Feliz is going to shortly drop and roll and be well clear at the front, even with a 15.7 second stop. The question is behind. Where do those behind fare relative to those that have already come out of pit lane? Venkata Raju is going to be very slow, but he's going to be clear of those behind. Sean Provo's going to be flying past and up to speed comes Tony Costello onto the track. My goodness, all of these drivers getting up to speed. Look at how long that blend line is. There's going to be a lot of side-by-side -side action going into this first chicane, and braking points are not going to exactly be correct. You saw it right there, one driver going off track. Don't know if that was Corolla or not. It was once again Jeff Corolla who's uh, not been having a great day, has he? It's just not been rolling his way as it, they all leave pit lane. And now with four and a half seconds up front, two seconds then between second and third, not really thinking there's going to be too much of a battle up towards the front. Instead, it might be behind Ross Sortino, who finds himself once again as the AM class leader. Sean Provost only has Tyler Graf between him and the driver that he's wanting to try and get closer to. I got to wonder what happened to Sean Provost, though, because that, well, I'm not sure if you're seeing this in your uh, lap 
or your box time, but it says 3.4 seconds it's, on my screen. It's the joys of iRacing's live timing. If you if you look at the cone to cone time, it's reasonable. If anything, it's, it's longer. A, exactly, it was actually a little bit longer in the box. So it's one of those fun situations where it almost runs a little bit wide out of the entry in towards Ascari and finds himself back. Uh, on focus and pretty quickly as well. Pete Mejia is going to have a look on Buck Hamilton, whose Ferrari does look a little bit worse for the wear, not just on the right front, but definitely on the left front. And that Porsche, which seems to have no damage, sails its way on through. Got to get that transponder screwed in a little bit harder. <laughs> oh, wow, man. I'm still amazed that we saw a pass on pit entry. Not often you see that something was awesome. like that. Very much a Sebastian Vettel move. Well, uh, you know, the thing that it reminded me of was VCO Infinity, which is coming back up this weekend, which uh, there will be a Precision Racing Esports team entered in. It's a 24-hour race, but unlike any other, 24 individual races. And we came here with the F4 car at Monza, and they tried that. And, and the Formula 4 car is a little bit smaller. Now, what's happened to Sean Provost? I'll get to story time later, because he's dropping down outside of the top 10. That's uh, interesting. Maybe it's just a slowdown for him because he picks back up his pace. Look at this pass again. The fact that he got it slowed down is so remarkable. Listen on board. Okay, and uh, maybe something to concede, though, is as much as he was aggressive, there was a lot of hesitancy there, wasn't there? There was so much hesitancy. And then in the background as yeah. well. <laughs> Yeah, you see that in the background from one awesome pit entry to uh, a less than stellar one all in the same shot as we get another look at what happened here going into the chicane. No. Jumping over is Sean Provost, and that's a slowdown. And, well, he was trying to get past Tyler Graff, remember, and that's an AM driver trying to pass the pro driver just to really try and close on the fellow class contender. And... It's why I'm so glad we've reintroduced the, uh, the Pro-Am split for uh, pro both the GT3 Sprint and the GT3 Fix because it just adds that little complexion to think about. And uh, it means that when we get to the final round of the season, Dylan, I think it's going to be all up for grabs. There may be some AM drivers that have built some speed, built some confidence, not fighting for a championship, and then some Pro drivers that have got to deal with the wrath of those machines. Yeah, 100%. As you see, Tyler Graff uh, trying to... Hold off Jay Steffi, but Steffi in the slipstream down the inside, heading to that first chicane. He's going to have the slight edge, and it's just the spot is just given up by Tyler Graff right there. I think the right move. It's uh, one of those things as well with 1.7 seconds back to two AM drivers that are fighting to then avoid Jeff Carollo passing them. Racecraft, 10 minutes left to go. Not always about fighting and fighting hard, but at the front of the field, I mean, what can you really say about the SGE esports driver? Felix Felice now almost five seconds clear and we haven't talked about him much I haven't looked at him very much either Dylan so let's look at him just a little bit beautiful <laughs> and, uh, it's going to be one of those races where I was talking about building confidence and speed right what more confidence than you can you build than at a track where everyone will have been talking about draft being so important breaking away and dominating proceedings yeah once he I mean, he, you got to remember, in the first few laps of this race, Ross Sortino was right there before Sortino got his slowdown penalty. And then F Felix Feliz was just able to break away. It was over two seconds in front, just kept moving forward, and it really ended up working out for him with just under nine and a half minutes to go in this race. This five-second advantage is huge. And Venka Taraju, you got to remember... Tony Costello's right there as well. So it's not like he's necessarily going on full out attack mode as much as he's got to think about defending. I did want to point out Jim Feliz was able to get on track, albeit one lap down. He is in 44th position, though. There, this is a nine round championship. In the first eight rounds, you're allowed to drop one. This is going to be drop one for sure, but it's a good thing that he's finished, what, first, second, and first so far this season with two pole positions and a couple fastest laps to go with. Not a bad record, and uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing how he goes next week when we make our way to the Circuit de la South. Now, can Bad Santa deliver some news to Andrew Trickett that 11th is right for the taking? Oh, he doesn't get it slowed down in time. Porsches aren't made for off-roading like that. And not only will he suffer the ignominy of a slowdown, he has to come to a complete stop in the 
act of trying to serve it. Well, listen, the Olympics in Paris are this summer. That's a hurdle right there. Nice. I don't know if Porsches can qualify for that, though. Uh, you know what? Uh, Porsche loves to try and do plenty of things. They sponsor a golf tournament. They sponsor a tennis tournament on the uh, women's tennis tour. So I'm sure we can try and find something for them to sponsor. And uh, the reason why I was kind of laughing is yesterday I had a, a meeting with my manager. And uh, at work, they all know that I'm a commentator. What Sometimes, you know, we have some fun conversations. Um, and so my manager brings up that on ESPN, he saw on the Oat Show, which you can already tell where this is going, <laughs> um, inflatable slip and slide stair slippy climb competitions. And uh, it is uh, literally as crazy as it sounds, Dylan. So if they can be on the Oat Show, I'm just saying we have to come up with some sim racing thing that is equally crazy. And my proposal is a sim rig where you are punished for crashing the car. I'm <laughs> what is the punishment? <laughs> uh, oh. That's what's going to make it a make or break right there, what the punishment is. I mean, will Venkataraju get punished here for having a slow exit out of the Parabolica? No, I think what we have to do is if you barge into somebody, then you just get a zap. You know, there's a, there's a little electric <laughs> shock that gives. But basically, race control. Race control has access to this. And, and if we want to make it even more entertaining, we give the fans, you know in Formula E they have fan boost and they yes. used to have it where you could vote for it. We do the opposite. You <laughs> fan get, zap. Yes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we who's, have just come up with crazy. Genius on RaceBot TV. They're battling side by side with Del Peterson passing Joey Costello for 15th and 16th positions. No zaps needed here, at least just yet. Ah, uh, there definitely will be going into the chicane. They're almost bump drafting like we're going to see at Talladega this weekend as they go side by side here. Who's going to win out the battle? Little touch into the grass, and they're sliding. Zaps, zaps, zaps. Oh, I mean, okay, no zaps because that was a good holding of the brake. Oh. Love to see it. I mean, that's about as safe as it could have been. Unfortunately, Joey Costello loses out just a little bit, and now Dale Peterson's off in the gravel as well. Zaps for everybody. Zaps for everybody. And, you know, that's one of those moments as a commentator, you can just see it coming. <laughs> yeah. We saw it that way as well. By the way, Vika Taraju uh, went off a little bit right there. He's really feeling the pressure, and it's allowing for Ross Sortino to start to get into this podium conversation. Still second behind, but Costello and Venka Taraju, they're, they're fighting big time here. And I have to assume that if you are, if you are Ross Sortino, you are going to at some point force the issue. You're not going to be content to just sit there and wait. You know there's some valuable points on the line and you've got the speed, you've got the draft. Make uh, good use of it when you can. Should only have three or four laps to go. Your race leader, Felix Feliz, kind of can slow down at this point and maybe uh, cut a lap out if that is what he wants to do. But it will all depend then on how aggressive the drivers behind want to be. Uh, Evan Mackay, Jared Deploy, and Sean Provost, they're all fighting amongst the uh, three AM drivers to effectively be second best now with Sortino scampering away. Sortino is certainly looking to get the lion's share of points here in the AM class tonight. I mean, that's the interesting thing, though, right? They are competing for a fewer number of points compared to maybe the pro-class drivers. Typically, it's always up for the taking no matter what. And it's not for the win of a class, but it is for who's going to get the biggest points gain um, in it. It's, it's a weird kind of mental game you got to play because even though you're not winning overall or you're not competing for second place in your class, it, it is still a big thing. Yes, and apparently, by the way, so big that Michael Fowler has decided that it's too stressful for his camera to be... T oh, turned on! What? And then Ryan Chandler wants to make sure that we know he's too cool for school. I mean, uh, he is way too, uh, way too cool for school right there. And uh, I wonder if... I, don't, I wonder what he's thinking right now. Currently P32. You know what he's thinking? That he's unfortunately losing out to Reagan and so there is uh, there's going to have to be some words exchanged in the household after that. One more driver by the way that is sharing their webcam with us here in this uh, fixed setup series is RaceBot's own Mark Kalin who took the challenge on from Joey Tebbin to join us on Tuesday nights and got to say 
full credit where credit's due. He's uh, getting uncomfortable and getting stuck in there and oh, bouncing his way through Ascari. And surviving is on for what will be a 14th in class finish, 30th overall. And, uh, and one thing to remember is a NASCAR tire, Dylan, very, very different from a GT3 tire. I know you have experience handling the NASCAR tires. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I got really excited that you brought that up because that is, that's like what my one claim to fame besides, you know, working in PR and NASCAR or whatever. Uh, I got to catch tires for uh, a one uh, <laughs> a win by AJ Allmendinger at the Rovals. That was a dangerous looking move uh, through that chicane right there. But hey, I'm one for one as a uh, tire catcher. So you can't do it again is basically what uh, you've got to tell the team. Anytime they come to you, you say, <laughs> no, we've got the 100% streak. Don't you dare ruin it. Uh, well, I asked. <laughs> I actually asked if anybody wanted me to... Uh, um, when we were doing in the off season uh, fire suit fitting, I'm like, hey, you guys want me to uh, get fitted for a fire suit? It was quickly shot down. <laughs> uh, I see. Uh, again, 100% streak. Dylan, don't push your luck. You, you've done something that not many will ever claim to be able to do. Here's a look, by the way, at what happened through that second chicane, and they were already basically glued together before they got to the corner. Uh, corner. And then that's what you want to do. Hold your brakes. The unfortunate thing is the teammate comes through and makes a bit of contact. Just got to be predictable right there. And uh, maybe he could have held the brakes a little bit earlier when he was still trying to jump over the curves. But hey, nonetheless, it, it was a good example of exactly what you said, Arjuna. Hold the brakes, be predictable. Even if you get hit, you did what you could do to avoid any further calamity. Now, one thing I just have realized, and I, I was alluding to it slightly earlier, but if Tony Costello was your race leader, this is, without a shadow of a doubt, the final lap of the race. Because Felix Feliz is six seconds in front, we're going to get one more lap after this, unless, for some reason, stranger things have happened, iRacing elects to throw the checkered flag. But, one more time into turn one, some of these drivers will be thinking moves can be made. Well, stranger things have certainly happened, and uh, iRacing is not always the most uh, on point when Barney throws the flag. Sometimes a hey, few it's seconds better than are Daytona still there. Earlier is, than this year. Listen, it's like two minutes better than Daytona earlier this I had year. To. That was crazy. I had to. It was crazy. Um, that was that was poorly diffy. <laughs> oh, I can't even imagine. Oh, oh, Ross Sortino! No, he's he's come to blows on the final. And the worst part is, not only is he going to lose the Am Class win, surely that car is going to be toast. I mean, it was almost a potential podium that he had on right there, but that car. Oh. It just doesn't sound good. That's a shame. Man. Ross made too many mistakes in this race. He I mean, was he had a pushing. Chance. He was pushing. He had a chance for the win at one point. He had a chance for the podium there. And uh, too many slowdowns. And obviously, with just a couple laps to go, that happens. As we're uh, probably going to now... One lap to go in this race, side by side between Deploy and Provost. And suddenly it's all, again, for an Amp class to win. And officially we're on to the final lap here in the Temple of Speed. I'm a little bit shell-struck, I'm not going to lie. Um, Ross Sortino, that's a big, big mistake and he'll rue it. He's holding on to 12th right now. How long will that last? No move into turn one though. Evan Mackay's got a good lead. Deploy. Looking a bit more in his rear view mirrors, it is still technically, let's not forget this, SRT 1, 2, 3 in class. Yeah, that is something that we have to remember here. They're all still teammates, but they all still want to beat each other in this championship, in this race, and they are race tra car drivers after all. <laughs> uh, whether the racing is real or virtual, trust me, race car drivers don't want to lift off. And Whoa, Sean Provost almost runs into the back of Jared Deploy. If you ever need it, just hear that a race car driver is not going to end up lifting off. Check back in at the front of the field, though, as your race leader begins that climb to Ascari for the final time. I mean, I could wax superlative about this sort of a drive, but it's been a great one. A bit of a breakout drive in many ways. Yeah, it certainly has been a breakout drive. Felix Feliz, who just got his third career pole in PRL competition overall, is about to win his first PRL race. Just one more corner to go. And there's something special when you win, right? But that first one, 
It sets things rolling, gets the ball rolling, if you will, but also just gives you that boost of confidence, gives you that momentum that you need. And at a place like the Temple of Speed, what better place to win? And by dominant style, six odd seconds, Felix Feliz victorious in the Precision Racing League GT3 Fix Series. He weaves back and forth as he takes in the adjuring roar of the crowd. And what a margin it was as well. The rest of the drivers will come to the line. Evan Mackay ends up doing enough to hold on to the AM class win. And it seems like a couple of drivers were very, very close on fuel. 51 took to the green, not as many going to see the checkered, but our expectations now set high, Dylan, for the sprint series ahead and the rain that we may see. Oh, goodness. <laughs> that is an appetizing or an enticing appetizer to what we might see later on. So, I mean, look at these drivers still fighting all the way to the line. Some photo finishes here and there, but no drivers getting within a couple of hundredths of one another. Instead, margins about a tenth or so, even though this is a track where photo finishes can expect to be seen. We saw passes on the entry into pit lane. We saw mistakes out on track, and we saw a race leader pulling away. Pro and Am splits bringing plenty of action, plenty of entertainment, and after this, draft's going to continue. I think that's one thing that these drivers will all just be thinking about Dylan is next time at the circuit de la South it's once again going to be all about how fast they are in a straight line yeah it's uh very much a uh, minimal drag kind of two race stretch that we've got going on here and uh I'm all for that that's a uh, that's a lot of fun these drivers don't have to dial in their setups of course in the sprint series they have the ability to do so as much as Ability does not always mean that you're going to have the best setup. Just uh, ask anyone who's tried a setup that's been developed by yours truly. We'll grab a look at the race results. We'll hopefully grab a chat with the drivers as well. And then looking forward to the racing that is still left to come here on a Tuesday night. But for SGE Esports, Felix Felice strikes number one for the first time. Six and a half seconds back to Tony Costello for SRT Esports Grey. Australia's Venkata Raju rounds out the podium in what is very much a field dominated by the Porsche 992s. Tyler Graf fourth, and then the three of the AMs that finish inside of your top 10. Evan Mackay in front of Jared Deploy and Sean Provost, SRT, E, one, two, three. Jay Steffi down in eighth position, which is fifth in class, let's not forget for him. Jeff Carollo, Andrew Trickett round out the rest of your combined top 10. And then Jared Keane in front of Ross Sortino, who ends up finishing down in 12th after challenging up towards the podium spots. As Raya Osborne, 13th in his Audi, while Andrew Venaro in the Riley Racing Ferrari finishes in front of Waldo Walden. Carlos Ocono, Dale Peterson, Sully Saad, and then Michael Fowler and Francis Parent round out your top 20. And of course, it's a big field, so we'll keep scrolling to the likes of Brett Thurman, David Morse, uh, Reagan Chandler, uh, Dave Peterson, Buck Hamilton, Creighton Carter, Ian Cabana, and then Ryan Chandler in front of Nathan Jennings and David Bush. Again, a couple of close finishes here and there. Uh, as noted towards the back, air, uh, back end rather of that top 30. Joey Costello, John Jones, Mark Kalen, Nicholas Johnson, Scott Jeffries, Travis Pruitt, uh, Alex Wright, Joachim Backer, and then Patrick Cowgill, all class on the leading lap. 39 GT3 cars, crazy, crazy numbers. Pete Mejia, the first one lap down, along with Christopher Ryan, Jim Felice, and Lucas Nguyen. Three laps down for Colin McKenzie. Seven laps down for Quincy Carter, who ended up being one of the most uh, recent uh, retirees at the end of the race. Kern de Gaal, William Fenson, Robert Jeffries, and then Frank Pisano, along with Kevin Burquist, all unfortunately not getting to see the end. Matt Hilton was one of the few drivers tangled up at the start of the race. And so he didn't get to see beyond the opening couple of corners. But that's a look top to bottom at the race results. And for the very first time, we can chat to Felix Feliz as a race winner. Felix, you got the lap done in qualifying. You stormed away and broke the draft. What was going through your mind as you got ready to dive down onto pit lane? Felix, do we have a copy? Can you hear me now? We got you loud and clear, buddy. How do you feel? Uh, excited, super excited. Um, you know, the whole race, I'm thinking, don't make a mistake. I've, I've been there a few times or I get in the pole and I end up wrecking on the first or second lap. So, um, you know, I just try to stay consistent. And, you know, staying consistent at a track like this, easier said than done. Next week, we're heading off to the circuit de la South. How are you feeling about trying to go back to back and breaking away with the draft there? How confident do you feel at a track as long as that? 
Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think I did very well last time I was there. So, you know, I just take it week by week. And we'll see you next week. Then congratulations, Felix, on this race victory. Enjoy it. And we'll see you in seven days' time. All right. Thanks. Felix Felice on top joins us for a chat and now make our way down to what was a close fight between Tony Costello and Treyas Venkataraju, but Tony Costello standing by with Dylan Coyle. Yeah, Tony did such a really nice job at the end there of uh, making sure he took second place away from your number 27 rival Venkataraju. But I got to say, you know, that resilience in the last few laps, uh, how do you stay so comfortable and confident in the chase with the time winding down? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, it was a really great race. I made one mistake early on and cost me a little time penalty. And so I was kind of playing catch up for the most part. But, um, you know, just persistence. I had a good pit stop. And I think the secret there is I took two left tires and it didn't cost me any time. And so I had I had more grip towards the end of the tr end of the race. And so, uh, yeah, I, I was just waiting. He was making some mistakes. And I was just waiting for the opportunity. Did the race uh, meet your expectations in terms of uh, how close you can keep to cars in front of you if you do start to make a mistake here or there? And I know we said 1.4 seconds was probably when the slipstream effects would come into effect or would go out of effect. And uh, it seemed like you definitely kept everybody honest there. Yeah, you know, I had a good race. I mean, I, I just tried to stay consistent with my times, tried to get through those chicanes, which are just sometimes, you know, such a mess. Uh, but yeah, you know, I just, um, I kept the pace up and I could tell I was, I was gaining on second. Like I said, that pit stop made a big difference, uh, having those tires. And then, like I said, it was just, you're right. I mean, if you're within like 0.8 seconds, you're in the slipstream, you know, and so you'll make up time. All right, Tony. Well, congratulations on the second place finish here. And, uh, any final words, anyone you'd like to thank? Oh, no, just like I would say my SRT team, we practiced a bunch this week and uh, it's just a fantastic team. So I'm lucky to be a part of it. Thanks, Dylan. Not a problem, Tony. Arjuna, Tony did such a solid job of getting second place in this race, but Shreya Vekitaraju, of course, rounded out the podium. Yeah, and we'll catch up with one final driver before we make our way over to the Sprint Series race. Shrey is third on track for you. A bit of an interesting race in terms of a driver breaking away, trying to then uh, see some challenges from behind. Talk us through that from your perspective. Well, that was a little scary, to be honest. Uh, the car completely disappeared, so I didn't know if he was glitching, if I could go. But he disappeared from my relative screen, so I figured I can just get on the gas. Luckily, no incidents to turn one. Monza is known for turn one carnage, so I'm happy uh, it was all clean. Yeah, we talked a little bit about how much carnage there was going to be. Uh, were you wondering, was it going to be dry or wet? Because we, we got word that the forecast for the sprint series was for a little bit of rain. Were you ever having to practice for those changeable conditions? I did not. I prayed to the race gods that it would be dry, and thank God they blessed us with no wet, no wet weather. <laughs> Maybe we'll get a bit of rain towards the end of the season. Congratulations on the podium, though, Shreyas, and we'll see you over at the Circuit de la South in seven days' time. Thank you, guys. Shreyas Venkataraju joins us here in the broadcast booth. And, well, I did mention that we are looking forward to the rain that lies ahead, but I think more importantly, first up, it's a trip over to the Circuit de la South. It's one of the most famous tracks, of course, in all of global motorsports. And, you know, draft is one thing when you come to Monza, but when you go to a track like Le Mans, Dylan, because its straights are so lengthy, right? Because you spend so much time just sitting there, letting the engine basically bounce off the rev limiter. It's a unique challenge, not just for the car, but for the driver as well. Yeah, 100%. And I feel like, you know, with the potential for rain in this one, and uh, obviously the Circuit de la Sarth providing a different kind of... Uh, you know, kind of venue, a different kind of race, a background. I think it's going to be quite interesting um, with the, just the racing, right? <laughs> We've seen this type of racing today from the Fixed series. We've seen the slipstreaming. We've seen some chicanes playing its own hand. But especially when we get here after this coming race in the Sprint series, I, I, I'm just curious to see if we're going to have weather issues in both. Uh, and again, fingers crossed, at least in my mind, that we do get a bit of rain. That will see us, of course, transition beyond the first half of the season as well, which is a bit of, 
bit of an interesting transition point for me personally, because of course, mention it slightly earlier, nine round championship. In the first eight rounds, you're allowed to take one of the races as a drop week. And I think we kind of now already probably know for Jim Feliz, one of our championship contenders, which of those rounds it's going to end up being for him. But it was dry when it came to the Fix series. Not so lucky in some ways if you're a driver in the Sprint series. The heavens have opened. Woo! We turn our attention back to the Temple of Speed. But this time with a little bit more jeopardy at play. Drivers on track for qualifying in the GT3 Sprint Series. And boy, are we going to be in for an interesting one. It's already been an interesting start to the season, of course. And as drivers get to grips with the conditions, let's talk you through the story of what these drivers have had to go through. Dylan, of course, very similar schedule. In fact, the same schedule that the drivers in the GT3 Fix Series have to go through. The only difference that we are kind of seeing week on week is whether the weather is going to end up playing its part, pun intended. Now, though, we can focus on Pro and Am Championships and split them up into their two. When you look at the pros here, it is just five points at the front between Gergo Baldi and Kevin, uh, Kevin Cantonio. One Lamus is then only one point further back, but three drivers split by just six points. Just barely separates uh, between those three drivers. And I think that's going to be quite fun if we get these drop weeks. I mean, they've all performed quite admirably, but if they continue the way they're moving here, I, the drop weeks might not matter too, too much. And, you know, the, the drop weeks are one of those elements heading into the final round as well, where that final round cannot be dropped, where you, you, you don't want to have to then think about what has already come, and you just want to have a as good a baseline as possible and so that's where you say again the drop weeks may not end up coming into play of course pro and am championship split up as well for these drivers and luis gruyon leads the am championship here in the Cibao racing team entry chris long is second and seven points back and then richard saavedra third 31 points back and we'll see how these drivers will build over the rest of the run towards the season finale team championships though well it's uh, looking quite fun at the front here, but not necessarily going to know how many teams will be there at the end. Precision Racing Blue find themselves 26 points clear of SCR Old Men, and then a further 30-odd points clear of Precision Racing Silver. It's hard enough to be consistent as one driver, Dylan. Imagine trying to do it with two drivers and then add the rain in as well. Yeah, once you get the rain added into the mix, I, I feel like with the team's championship, it's it's much harder to basically say, hey, uh, let's watch it as the season progresses, especially when we're still one third of the way into the season. The driver's championship, yes, we'll follow it a little bit more closely, but the team's championship is a lot more where the cards fall. We, we don't really know. There's just way too many variables at this point to, to say anything. One thing that I will just point out as we get ready to go underway, uh, iRacing did drop a new build slightly earlier today, uh, and some drivers have been experiencing some technical issues here and there with the rain. It is very possible that we will find this round ending up being as a non-points round. However, we're going into this race, of course, with the expectation that hopefully we'll have no dramas and we'll get to the end of this race and hopefully have a great race as well. Mention that qualifying is underway. Already burned through almost 16 odd minutes of it. And I can tell you right now, it's Boris Evando at the top in a Porsche. This is where as well, choice of car dealing comes into play. We often talk in the real world about Porsche with its rear uh, engine nature, you know, putting weight onto the rear tires when you need traction in these wet conditions. Maybe not a surprise to see a Porsche 1 and 2 in this qualifying session. Yeah, would not be surprised at all. They're uh, very nimble and they handle quite differently compared to every other car in this field. However, um, I must also say they're a lot more of a, of a uh, what's the word? They're more difficult to handle. <laughs> and in these conditions, yes, the potential is probably higher for them to go faster, but there's also a higher chance that they can just absolutely throw it away quickly. This is crazy as well. Like I, I've, the I racing Sebring 12 hours. You know the first chance that we really got to see of the rain. It added a lot, but what ended up happening is we got two bouts of rain and then a lot of dry running, and so plenty of chaos happened in those blocks where rain 
was around, but outside of that, Dylan, because we'd had so much chaos, it then ended up being quite stale in the other sort of dry periods. Oh, Gonzalo Cortez hits the wall down the pit straightaway. This looks torrential. Like, these look like conditions, I'll just be quite honest, that we'd probably end up red flagging in the real world because it just looks like there's pools of water everywhere. It's not even like there is grip to be found. It doesn't look like there's any grip whatsoever. Well, <laughs> just taking the boat off track right there. My goodness, you see cars just sliding, slipping everywhere. These lap times, compared to what we saw in the fixed series race, 25 seconds slower in qualifying. Wow. And okay, again, these drivers have got to build setups that will adjust for probably both dry and wet, like in expectation that maybe there's going to be a bit of a transition period. Now, we're seeing some fastest laps come in, but I think that's more just drivers getting to grip through the conditions. Uh, Keith Maines had it momentarily, but a quarter of a second quicker now is Chris Song. Uh, with two minutes left in this session. Only 27 times on the board, and I mentioned some of those issues that uh, some of the drivers had experienced. I see at least 15 or uh, another 20 or so of them that maybe could also be on the board, but haven't been able to do so just yet. And so I think this is going to be feeling out process. It'll be fun feeling out process as well, because where else, Dylan, do you, you know get the ability to go and race wheel to wheel with people where maybe you don't have the expectation of it also being a points race, but you do have the expectation of having to keep it clean. Yeah, and uh, it's very difficult to, to keep it clean regardless of uh, whether it's raining or dry conditions here because it is so fast and there's so many drivers that are kept within a very small amount of space. Uh, you're always racing hard. Here, though, it's going to be treacherous. Yeah, this is... This is I mean, just looking from this nose camera perspective as well, you're watching the drivers searching for where the grip's going to be. And Monza, because it is, you know, naturally bumpy, it will play as an interesting sort of um, analysis for, for the drivers because the traditional racing line is, the way that iRacing's described it, is that that's where, you know, the, the, the gravel, the tarmac rather, were, wears away the most. And so there's... It's a lot smoother, there's less ridges in it, whereas where you go off the traditional racing line, it's less worn down, there's more ridges, and that's where the water's then able to flow through. But, you know, Dylan, because of this track's so bumpy, I wonder if, you know, the racing line having bumps kind of will make it a little less slippery, just in that little bit of nature. Yeah, and I, I wonder if that's the case too, but we did talk about you know monza having those bumps naturally growing growing over time that's a that's a weird way to talk about asphalt and the track changing uh, but the bumps definitely are showing and it's not sebring but you still got to respect them here especially in these conditions so checkered flag is going to fly not necessarily sure how many drivers are actually out there and pursuing a flying lap versus getting to grips with these conditions lots of spray as well and that's even with our racing turning down uh, the amount of spray miles brown jumps to second on the qualifying board i can uh, let you know about that but dylan have you had a chance to play around with the rain i know you haven't had a chance to commentate on a rain race yet but have you had a chance to drive on our racing's rain uh, no, I have not. <laughs> I have not. So this is going to be a really interesting watch. <laughs> so, so what we're going to have to do clearly with you um, is bragging rights four whenever that comes around. Dylan, you'll be practicing yes. for that, right? Representing race spot in the battle of the commentators. Oh, absolutely. Okay, I'm just making sure because... Um, oh, I was there last time, you know. Exactly. I, I put in a pretty solid open wheel performance. No, no, no. The real problem here is we, we can't let Sim, Sim Speed win again. It just cannot happen. Well, absolutely. We got to make sure it's not just Lorenzo Bonder who is <laughs> handling the torch for race bonding. That is also actually a very good point as well. Now that you mention it, uh, we got to make sure that Lorenzo is put in a car where we can maximize his talent. The rest of the drivers coming towards the line. Abner Acosta has just jumped to the top with a 2.10.684. That's eight thousands quicker than Mateus Carvalho that now is in second. This is on board with Miguel Coron that's running his way to the line. That windshield wiper having to work very, very hard. I can only imagine what it's going to be like when we have the cars 
running their way down in towards turn number one. Carl Colbert jumped up into fourth position. He's now the best of the AM drivers. I, I, I'm, I'm very curious what turn one's going to look like here. <laughs> we said chaos the last time, right? Well, we didn't get any ca chaos, we Dylan. We really didn't. We, we both really said didn't. yes. Well, have you ever seen uh, the clip of Formula One, I think in 2007 at the Nürburgring uh, in corner number one? Which clip in particular are we talking about? Because they've had a few clips at turn one over the years as has uh, Formula One. Uh, the one where in turn one they just kept all... Oh, yes, 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 with the that, rain. Yeah. yeah, yeah, now I know which year you're talking about. To be honest, as a Kimi Raikkonen fan, I'm, I'm just always scarred. Whenever, whenever anyone talks about the Nürburgring and Kimi, I just instantly think of when his rear wing decided to no longer be on his car, um, which then presumably, as you might expect, ended in the wall. Uh, I, I never got to finish my VCO Infinity story, did I? Do, so... Time for me to say that as we get ready to go to the grid. We had drivers try to fit Formula 4 cars side by side on pit entry, and they couldn't do that without crashing. It goes to show what a great move Venkata Raju made around the outside of pit entry in that previous race. I just hope that no one tries it again in here because I don't know if I could take the stress. Ready to go racing. Not sure how ready these drivers are with these changeable conditions. You can see them there with the lights on and ready to rumble. Let's take a look at how they'll line up. It's a 2.12.077. That's good enough for Boris Evando to lead us to the green. Keith Maines will be alongside. And then Chase Wilson and Abner Acosta line up third and fourth. In fact, I thought that's how they're going to line up. But that does not look like the correct starting grid. So we're going to reset, press the buttons again. And by the magic of live broadcasting, there's a look at your starting grid. Boris Evando, Abner Acosta, 1.3 seconds splitting them on the front row. And then Mateus Carvalho and Rich Calais, third and fourth positions. Calais, the best of the AMs. He's got Carl Cobert up there in the field as well. And then Chris Song is sixth position. Rolling from the outside of row three. Emmett Linkfist and then Nani Tavares, 7th and 8th, with Miles Brown and Keith Maines, 9th and 10th. Are you Mercedes? No, once again, not in a Mercedes. Alongside Alex Almeida, 11th and 12th positions, with hopefully not unlucky 13th for the fiercely forward metentry of Aiden Young. Chase Wilson rolls alongside with Diego Are and then Gurgo Baldi wants some work to do from 16th on the board. Jeremy Littleton and Luis Grillon roll alongside one another on row nine with Chris Long and Juan Malagon making up the rest. So your top 10 starting rows. Ethan Bast and then Marc-Andre Garon, 21st and 22nd with Martin Crispin and Fernando Yaquez behind them. Still going to find Rapid Ray Dominguez, Douglas Corey, Jason Hodgson, Juan Lemus, and then Richard Saavedra and Nestor Santana. Now, these are plenty of drivers, of course, in the mix for the championship. Wonder how many issues they're all having to deal with. Jason Allen, Diego Morales, Eric Soropoli, Kevin Cantonio, Gonzalo Cortez, and then David Mendoza rounding out your top 36. And still going to find Miguel Colon, uh, Oliver Rodriguez Santos, Jack uh, Hedgecox, Kevin Simpson, Andre Bernati, Chris Stewart, and then... At the very back of the grid, Devin Brock and Sean Murphy. Not sure how many drivers are going to end up taking to the start here, uh, but I don't think that's going to matter because that still looks like a very ominous sign. Yeah, this is uh, going to be quite wild with uh, upwards of over 40 drivers taking part in this race. It's uh, ooh going to be scary. Oh, they're already spinning. Oh, no, that's Chris Long. Uh, it's Chris Long in the Lamborghini. I hope he's going to be able to avoid causing any more chaos. And then the worst part is that Dilly, he's got to try and get back to where he's originally meant to start this race. In fact, never mind, he's bailed and he's going to head back to pit lane. That is a uh, ominous sign. Well, that's a look from up above. It's not a very good look from up above, is it? <laughs> you can't see a thing. Is it better than what the drivers see? I mean, this is at low speed, to be fair. I get the sense that once the spray's kicking itself up, it's going to be very difficult to spot the braking marks into the opening corner. I'm quite scared, Dylan. I don't know about you. Yeah, uh, you can't see a dang thing uh, from the top-down view right there. The drivers aren't going to be able to see anything uh, from their front windshields, and uh, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs>
If anyone's wondering why we don't have any McLarens in the series, it's because it breathes too much fire and we can't control its chaos. Especially since we're ready to go racing in extreme wet conditions. Doesn't get much wetter than this if we're being completely honest. And now we've got to navigate GT3 cars around the Temple of Speed. Might be a temple of safety in towards turn number one. And Boris Evando is going to have to try and navigate his way through. But he's got a clean uh, sight in front of him. Spray being kicked up behind as who's going to be deep onto the brakes into turn number one. One of the Seabell racing cars is slipping, sliding. D Almeida has gone around. You can tell just how treacherous it is as the cars try and get onto the brakes. I mean, that is a sight of cars tiptoeing it through the opening corner. Gogo Baldi's made contact with the 77 machine of Diego Ere, and they're all just piling in as well. They're just pushing him on through. Get out of the way. Oh, no. Into the gravel trap from one of the leaders. And that was through Curva Grande, which was meant to be foot to the floor in the dries. Now, Abner Acosta defends from Mateus Carvalho. This for second spot. I could walk faster than this right now. Carvalho gets tagged. Here's going to be more co a chocker block chaos. I, I don't even know what to say right now, Dylan. I am speechless. I am lost for words. <laughs> Oh, man. This is uh, going to get worse before it gets better. And, uh, well, one driver that's smiling through all of that, Boris Evando, five and a half seconds clear already, and we're not even out of Lesmo 2. This is a look from up above. You can see behind, looks like there's fighting off of the corner. But this is a run on towards the back straightaway, being a bit more chaos for some of our contenders behind, that's uh, Richard Saavedra's triple nine. That's very, very slow. I mean, I don't even know where to look right now because uh, you can't look. That's the answer. I mean, any drivers trying to go side by side into a corner like this is not going to work out. As under braking, you saw another car go off multiple cars. I mean, this is just uh, uh, look at Boris Avando's lead already. This is treacherous. And if you're wondering, they are all on the wet tire. There is no one on the dry tires. Uh, I, I figure that was a moot point, but uh, I'll just I'll, I'll emphasize that now. I mean, this camera angle at Ascari is giving us a look at the field just streaking across the final sector. But there's the edge of the top five. There's your race leader, seven seconds clear. And clearly, clean air is going to be a bit of a benefit because you have that visibility in front of you. Abner Acosta's got Rich Calle behind him. Best of the Ams, then Nani Tavares, Chase Wilson, Chris Song, Carl Colbert, and then Mateus Carvalho. Into turn number one. There's a jink to the inside. Acosta defends from Rich Calle. And then no move further behind. They, they, are, they are going at a crawl right now. Yeah, look at this. A little bit of a fishtail right there by the driver in front. The Lambo trying to make a move, but you can't get any traction. Oh, man, this is so treacherous. And look at this. Going a little bit too high was a Porsche right there. <laughs> I think Rich Calley wants no part of this right now, uh, and I don't think I blame him. We started with 41. You can hear the, you can hear the rain more than you can hear the engines most of the time. And I think that should tell you all you need to know right now about just how difficult this is really for these drivers. Oh, Rich Calley's got a problem. There's something more going on here, I think, because he is just not able to get his power down. Behind him, a bit of a traffic jam. Mateus Carvalho got tangled up in that. I mean, this, he's hit. He's down on pit lane after starting on the outside of the front row. This looks like a, a pit stop cycle right here. I wish. <laughs> I can't believe the lead that Boris Avando has had. And Abner Acosta just throwing it on as well to everybody else in the field. Yes, he's just three seconds in front of third and nine and a half back of Avando. What does Avando have in that car? <laughs> uh, he's got the uh, magic of sanity. I think that's probably the most important thing. Mateus Carvalho. Now, I can't even see what happens. He just pulls to the side and he stops. What in the right on board and let's see if we can figure out if something goes wrong here um <laughs> i'm confused bewildered i'm confused as well i mean i almost feel like at that moment you're you're kind of just dealing with the the rain 
and uh, the lack of confidence that you've got. Uh, you see cars flying by next to you. You don't want to put the throttle down too much because if you do, you spin the tires really easily. I mean, look at this. You can't see a dang thing right here. And this is on board with Aiden Young, who pops out to the left-hand side, just trying to get a bit more visibility. We're down to 30 three left on the leading lap at this point with what is only two laps complete and that is i mean you can't see anything from up above there's some cars down below allegedly working their way through the opening chicane the bright yellow entry that you can see from up close not uh, visible from the high camera perspective that we had from on high this is definitely just going to be a race of survival isn't it and boris Avando, i mean let's ride on board with him because we could probably learn a thing or two, Dylan, about how to drive in these rain conditions. I mean, 100%. Let's watch on board because, of course, you want to go. I mean, he's almost taking the normal racing line right there. It, there's no dry line appearing at all right now. It's still raining hard. Look at where he shifts as well, by the way. Right now, he's not going to shift in the sixth. But when he upshifts, it's early. This looks so painful. Oh, my gosh. He doesn't want to induce any wheel spin. So you see how quick that shift was? The moment he hit the red. It's one of those things where he's managing, right? That's all he's doing right now. He's not racing. He's managing. And, ooh, Chris Song's off. This is what the, the danger is through Ascari in the side-by-side. -side now just working their way past him so clearly there are drivers who feel confident enough to try and make something happen but uh, credit to them for being able to do that I mean this is this is crazy stuff and it, it's such a contrast that's the that's the wildest part of this is that you know to compare this to what we had with the the fix series which was as dry as could be this is about the other other end of the spectrum and I and I do feel as though you know in many ways this could be a red flag situation in the real world. Uh, oh, 100%. Look at that. There's going to be some contact there. And kudos to both of them for now for slowing it down enough. I just don't know how you run side by side like this and try to get the power down. They did it right there. They slowed it down by helping each other out just a little bit. I couldn't quite tell who that was, if it was uh, Lamus or Song or... Oh, my gosh. The, the spray is just... Uh, There's a pass being made somewhere. <laughs> we just can't really tell who it is. That's Ethan Bass, who's um, in that 4GT. And, well, Chris Song's been sent off into the uh, runoff at turn number one. Not pretty. And, unfortunately, another thing for race control to take a look at. Poor race control's probably going to have to take an entire week just from this <laughs> one race. Yeah, I do feel really, really bad for them, but... There might be a point within the next few minutes that we get to uh, the amount of runners in this race being fewer than half, maybe? You, I don't know. Don't say that. I mean, 41 started. We're down to how many is that on the lead lap? 29, technically. But, yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't, you're, don't lead, that evil. You're, you're leading me down a, down a hole. That path I can't Exactly. That, that, that path that we really don't want to run down. Nani Tavares, though, is... Well, hunting Abner Acosta and that Ferrari looks very, very unsettled into the braking zone of Ascari. It's not uh, a lack of risk right now, that is for sure. The one thing you always get told is stay off the curbs because they are so slippery. Nani Tavares is not heeding that uh, advice. Oh, man. That is, uh, that, is, that is quite crazy. Abner Acosta, by the way, has lost time to Boris Abando. Tavares is Tavares is right there, and uh, we've got a battle for P2. Looking forward to it, too. Uh, Audi Mercedes is off in the grass, which in these rain uh, st and stormy conditions, that grass gets very, very, very damp and soggy, and you, it's, it's a struggle to get out of it. And so you really need to make sure you carry your momentum through. There is a lapped car in front of your uh, battle for second, by the way. Your race leader is 30. <laughs> We're ten, we're 10 minutes into a 40-minute race, <laughs> and your race leader is 13 seconds clear. I mean, it, it's crazy that you could have looked at that time two, three, four minutes into this race, and it was pretty much eight seconds in front, nine seconds in front. 
I think he slowed it down now because he knows, hey, what's he doesn't the first have to. <laughs> right. What's the first rule of winning a race? It's not being the fastest when you're in first. It's being as slow as you could possibly be and still hold first place. That's how you handle and make sure the equipment's okay. And let's assume this ends up being, you know, a point scoring race. Then, you know, you talk championship contenders. Well, Gurga Baldi, Kevin Cantonio, and Juan Lemus. Well, uh, Juan Lemus, where is he? I just hear rain, by the way, in my in my cans. But Lemus is 16th. Baldi, championship leader, he's 11th. And Cantonio, where is he? I can't even see him on my timing screen right now. I'm, oh, he, he's right behind, right behind Gogo Baldi. I wasn't even looking in the right place. <laughs> it's it's. In fairness, you can't really see what's going on on track with this rain and well, the spray. Well, in, in fairness, he started down the back as well. That That's also true. <laughs> oh, Cantonio getting a little bit squirrely out of the second Lesmo right there. I am uncomfortable, that is for sure. These drivers... Yeah, I'm but uncomfortable. Basically, what it means is, you know, championship situation... Boris Ovando is 18th in points coming into this race. He missed the first round of the season, but he's got a race victory, unlike the three drivers that we had talked about being the potential breakaway, who are still yet to notch that first victory on the season. Gurgo Baldi gets a poor runoff of Ascari. I think slightly also there, the camera angle shows Cantonio getting a bit of a wiggle there. The one time damage to your car at Monza not, is not an issue is when there's this much rain. Well, <laughs> might help the cooling. When, when, it, it won't help with cooling whatsoever, and uh, he's going to have to make this Ferrari as wide as possible. Hey, look, pit stops. Now, is this kind pit of? stops Maybe? in the uh, sense of get me out of Dodge? It might be as Cantonio <laughs> down to pit lane. Let's, I, I, I tell you what, as much as it's interesting seeing drivers try and stay on track, this is what your race leader is going through. You see his camera, you see his inputs kind of there as well if you really look hard at his stream, but that is a driver that is at one with the elements right now. And and I love seeing the pedal inputs as well because you can see he's never braking too hard. He's never really on throttle too hard either. He's progressive with everything. Unlike me, a bit of a caveman with my inputs, Dylan, where it's basically... Um, Binary, zero or one, maximum or none? Well, <clears throat> maximum or none. Let, let's watch, by the way, this uh, this bottom right in-car cam. Uh, what do you think of these in-car cams, by the way? It's a very fascinating by showing us what he exactly is seeing. Well, uh, what I will say is that we can already see his iRacing screen, so that part's pretty, pretty pointless. Uh, what I like seeing always is the driver's faces. And then, really, everyone knows I like playing detective. I, I like being Sherlock Holmes, finding my Watson, uh, and then trying to figure out what's in the background for all the drivers, because that is a lot of fun. Uh, and, and, and mainly why I'm a commentator at this point, to be honest, just so I can really go and dive into the bedrooms of various sim races as we look on board with Nane Tavares just behind now, Abner Acosta. You know, it is funny, right? It's people watching at its finest, and... Uh we kind of uh, try to say people watching, and goodness me, Abner Acosta was almost made into a meal right there. And well, Abner Acosta is known as the tire whisperer, but right now he's just doing to whisper to. <laughs> doing exactly what he needs to, placing his car at the right spot at the right time and holding on. There's, you can see half a lane effectively. Nani Tavares is not trying to get too far out of the spray because he's at recognizing that he's probably not going to end up making the move happen and eventually uh, Costa's going to slide back across spray dies down as the speed uh, dips off as well and trails away and now it will kick back up as they stomp onto the loud pedal and interesting to see that both drivers try and get a little bit off to the left because now they'll arc that speed and maybe there's a bit of a puddle on the inside of Curva Grande look how much they're avoiding that and they're very very deliberate mm -hmm. in the line they're taking well, it's the banking, right, of Curva Grande where the water does seep to the right side there. The typical racing line is the inside. Uh, you don't want a hydroplane, so you are going to take the long way around the hydroplaning and the long way around. Oh, Aiden Young. Bit of a uh, perfect, feel old. <laughs> perfect example there and definitely would have added a couple of years to the, and at least a couple of gray hairs, that's for sure, and then into the braking zone. I mean, they're having to use the curb. There's no other real option at the end of the day this is this is wild stuff 
as no both second and third synchronized spinning chase wilson takes the two for one oh, splitting the middle goes a bunch of doing? drivers and well our, our camera tells us the wrong angle there but uh, heavens above that could have been bad <laughs> that was uh they hit each other trying to get back up to back straight as well I think they probably hit each other a few times. Surely they hit each other to initially go around. Well, surely. Surely. They can't have just synchronized spun. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah. And and, and this is where you, our camera cut away, but wait, wait, wait. Acosta hits the wall, and then right there. That, that could was, have been uh, bad. Ooh. Yeah, that's just a, it's kind of an unsafe rejoin no matter where, where you look at it. Um... And nonetheless, it's a shame, right? Abner was uh, holding second, but really started to to fall back, I'd say. And now the lead is 17 seconds, so 18 seconds. How about that? And Chase um, Wilson suddenly finds himself in a great spot to grab a podium. Chase Wilson slowing. I mean, is that just the natural corner progression of the intervals? Yes, it is. Okay, <laughs> I saw the, the gap going higher and higher, but... Obviously, uh, that happens when other cars are slowing down, and uh, we see Chase Wilson, and that gap is somewhere between 15 to, to 17 or so seconds in real time. Yeah, we, and a half. we won't have a proper confidence on the gap until we get to the end of the race, to be honest. I mean, we're almost halfway through. How many are still running? 41 took the green. 33 out there and running, of whom 27 are scored on the leading lap. Um, I will also just say, if you're watching and you're wondering, uh, is it looking a bit stuttery? Uh, apologies for the frame rate, but iRacing has decided with as many cars as we have on track, as much rain as we want to have, that frames should be rendered uh, a little bit slower than normal. And uh, it's making it a little bit difficult to try and follow some of the action occasionally when it does seemingly go to a bit of a, a PowerPoint slideshow. Aiden Young, slow down penalty. And now having to really watch out with Keith Maines going around the outside. That's no front brutal. end on the Porsche. And he still makes it work. <laughs> I mean, come on. You, By the way, you see that dry line starting to form just a tiny bit? I know it's still raining, but all these cars are pushing the water out to the edge. And that's the really cool thing about the iRacing weather system here is you do have the weather naturally progressing. No, Ethan Bass. That's what oh. you get for driving a Ford. No, I'm, jo I'm only joking, hey, Ethan. Hey, 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 hey. This, hey, though, down. is calm what I was down. talking about when I was referring to the grass. Oh, and I'm... Oh, no. Please don't, don't tell do me it. he's about to be bogged down. Please tell me you can actually oh. get yourself out of here. Because once you come to a stop... Oh. Okay. okay, maybe the Ford's got enough grunt and torque that it makes it work. Well, it was also right sides on the grass. The only tire that was in the gravel still was, I believe, the left rear right there. But I mean, still soggy grass is not a great thing either. So no, there's not much traction to be gained there. So. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. Oh. Crazy, crazy thing. I'm just going to speculate. Dylan, yes. could they do this race without coming down for fuel? I don't know. Now, I, when was the last race in the Pre uh, Precision Racing League GT3 Sprint Series that we saw a no-stopper. If I had to go off memory, which is a dangerous assumption if we're being honest, <laughs> I think it was Daniel Ferguson at the Hungara ring. And as Nane Tavares has made a small mistake and Abner Acosta is going to pass him. So that would have been going on almost three seasons ago. And that was in the dry. And basically, the only time we ever see those sort of uh, you know, no stop races are when they're short tracks, not much full throttle time. You know, you can afford to do a lot more coasting. Are these so, treacherous conditions going to enable that much coasting? I don't think so. I mean, I feel like the last time, the last race, right? We started to see pit stops just around the halfway point as we expected. These tanks are a little bit bigger in terms of capacity because the uh, Sprint Series has 50% fuel capacity while the Fixed Series has 40%. So that is something to keep in mind, even with the extra five minutes. Um, let me do some math here. Let me do some math. Okay. Uh, but it, again, just to clarify, this is commentator math. So we're going to take it with a pinch True. of salt. So um, Absolutely. We'll, we'll also see if anyone in the chat's going to try and help us because that would also be very, very beneficial. This this is wild. Uh, I've never quite seen anything like this. Um, 
commentated on a few rain races since we've had it join us on iRacing, but uh, yeah, this is this is something new. And uh, Chase Wilson's doing a pretty decent job, I must say. Last lap closed about 1.3 seconds. Wondering if that's going to be a bit of a uh, a trend that's going to build to 11.165 for Boris Avando at the line for Chase Wilson in the Lamborghini. It's another 209. So. On a bad sort of stretch so far as he tries to cut the gap down. I've got some answers for you, Arjuna. Okay, some, answer away. Some estimates here. Uh, we went around 19, 20 laps in the fixed race, and with a 40% fuel tank and a 35-minute race, the drivers started coming down pit road. In, in mass, I'd say around lap 12 or 13 of running. You extend that out for the... Uh, if it's dry conditions and a 50% fuel tank, yeah, you can give or take 14 or so laps, I'd say, is when you'd see drivers really start to come in. Well, they've raced 10 laps in this race. Another four laps uh, will take off over two minutes per lap time. We're looking at maybe 10 minutes, 30. Oh, no, who was that? Was that Young? I think it was. Off? Yes, it was Aiden Young having a treacherous kind of day for himself. But going back to what I was saying, uh, Ten and a half minutes to go on dry conditions. We'd see them reach that point that we see them go into the lane. But the coasting, the stopping, can you save five laps of fuel compared to dry conditions in these conditions? I guess we'll find out. Take a look at what happened to Young. Uh, I, I say take a look. We'll, we'll take a look at the spray. And that's Gogo -Go Baldi. You can tell by the lack of front wow. end on the Scuderia Ferrari eSports team machine. <laughs> and that's why Young is going no further because that right rear pancakes the wall about as hard as you could hope for. Let's jump on board and take the ride on board with this Ferrari. You can't stop it. And it gets in the air as well. There was a, it's a clip from a, almost 25 odd years ago now where... Uh, Alan McNish was in um, an Audi R8, the mm -hmm. open cockpit Audi R8 back in the day. And uh, a prototype car had a brake failure or something, basically launched over the sausage curb and just went over the head of the, the driver exposed in that car. And it could have been a lot worse. And so, you know, that's the crash that you'd expect to see here at Monza. Very, very realistic crash. Yeah, very realistic, especially with the uh, weather conditions, basically making the, the grass and uh, even the asphalt, uh, right, just feel like uh, they're hydroplaning all the way as we see some, uh, I was going to say a little bit of uh, gamesmanship there for a top five position. Right now, this is a battle for the podium. Yeah, and I just want to, to reiterate, we have seen a couple of technical issues here and there so far today, so... I do get the feeling that there's a couple of drivers that, you know, may not be on the lead lap anymore, but have not been involved in incidents. So just keep that in mind as much as this has been being insane. Not every driver has been making those slip ups if you see them down the order. And that includes like some of those championship contenders potentially um, who have continued just to try and stay out of trouble and fight their way from the back of the field. Rich Calley gets a very good drive out of that second chicane. And Carl Colbert fight for the AM-Class win. And hold on around the outside in that Ferrari. Very, very different sort of racing as well, right, Dylan? You don't rely on the same moves as you would in the dry. Yeah, 100%. You kind of have to approach every... Obviously, you have to approach every single corner differently uh, when you're just racing yourself versus the track. But when you are racing other drivers right around you, that changes it even more because all of a sudden, the track width narrows up so much between actual racing and passing lines and actual, you know, survivable lines, right? Because you see, oh, Rich Calais just... Oh, man, there's just nowhere you can really gain traction that's different from where they're gaining traction already. Somehow, obviously, Boris Avando, Chase Wilson have been able to do that. But you got to think, you know, Kyle Colbert, who, by the way, third overall and the AM class leader, th that's impressive, too. Calais is also in the AM class. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, I think the, the answer for Boris Avando clearly is grip hacks. Uh, <sighs> That, that's what's happening right now and we need to go and understand exactly the source of his speed um for anyone who who thinks that's serious no i'm joking um 
Boris Evando just clearly. Changeable conditions, master of them. One thing I'm looking forward to seeing more of as this weather system gets more and more utilization here on iRacing. And we're just seeing it totally soak the track right now. But Dylan, imagine what would happen if, for example, Curva Grande had that puddle on the inside and you'd still be, you know, slip and sliding on the outside. The mm -hmm. other side of the track was bone dry. That's the sort of thing that we're really going to be looking forward to. Oh, 100%. And I just don't think we're going to be seeing that that much in this race. It's still raining, right? It's not too much of a changing track condition except for the rain being pushed off to the edge uh, by the, uh, the cars on track right now. What I really would have been interested in is, uh, and obviously we've seen it through some endurance races already on Race Spot TV, is when the track does go from completely dry to completely wet to back to completely dry and all in between what happens, how their strategies kind of change and evolve as the race goes on and who's going to be the master of the wet weather racing. Uh, we sometimes talk about different phases of the race, right? When you when you have the rain come in, then there's no more phases anymore because everything just gets kind of reset and it goes from there. Kevin Cantonio, by the way, he's down in 12th overall. Just a quick recap of the championship drivers. Gogo Baldi's up to 8th position in the overall running order. And then uh, Juan Lemus finds himself having officially retired from this race with... 15 minutes left to go and I'd have assumed at this point drivers would probably be down on pit lane in the dries so knock on wood we'll see if there is anyone that is going to try and do the no stop strategy there is Boris Evander still working by the way pass some lap traffic that's not going to make life easy yeah 100% not at all and uh, you got to imagine he's going to use all the buffer that he possibly has to safely get past these drivers. I mean, there are blue flags, so uh, uh, you hope that they're going to get out of the way, and they certainly do get out of the way. Uh, make that 20 drivers right now on the uh, lead lap. Yeah, it's, uh, it, does, it almost looks as though the rain is getting worse. All right, listen. <laughs> The problem Nobody is... Nobody wants to hear that who is driving on track. Yeah, but they can't hear us, so it's okay. The problem is the TV sure? cameras give us a very different perspective, I feel like, than what the onboards do, right? The onboards... I'm not saying it looks good. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Let's jump on board with Rich Kelly. <laughs> it does not look good. But then you, you, you look off board, and it looks almost apocalyptic in some ways. It does look apocalyptic. That's a... That is a great descriptor, uh, description, descriptor, excuse me. How often do the heavens open like this? Let's be honest. Oh, uh, goodness. I can't think of a, I, I can think of a couple years ago, uh, the 24 hours of Daytona. True. Uh, 11 hours of that race was under caution flag conditions for rain. I guess if you live in, you know, tropical sort of places, I guess you would be sort of used to these sort of monsoon sort of rains as well. But Chicago street course. Uh, sure. Totally. <laughs> last year. <laughs> that was brutal. But, uh, you know, the, I guess Japan's the other place, right? Fuji, that yeah. would be one of the, the ones that we'd expect this level of rain now. Oh, gosh. Yeah, are we going to end up seeing some back and forth? Fernando Yaquez is directly behind both Rich Kelly and Carl Colbert. And Colbert a little bit slip and sliding on the run out of Ascari. Just look how tentative he is on getting that power down. Porsche pops to the outside and uses that traction, the weight on the rear wheels, of course, and might even get the move done before they even enter the braking zone into the Parabolica. Long way around, a long distance as well, but moves made. Amclass lead switches hands. Rich Calais hits third overall. That's entirely brave from Calais to try and uh, block off the uh, the run that Colbert might have tried to regain. And Colbert's going into the pit. So to answer your question of, of whether or not these drivers can make it, it looks like Colbert is giving her answer no. Maybe I wonder if that's what some of these drivers behind have just been thinking about. Have they done some fuel saving here and there? Could they cut out a pit stop that would end up saving them around 30 something odd seconds as that was not Calais. the right line from Rich Calais. That's a definite slowdown. Where does Fernando Yaquez end up cycling through? Is he going to get up to speed? He's going to have to get to the inside as well. He will make that pass happen. Rich Calais passed as well by Juan Malagon. So both of the Seabell Racing Team cars now end up cycling past the AMS and that's vital. They get some free points without having to fight for it on track. 
Well, now you have to wonder where the 38 will come out because obviously Colbert should get in front of Rich Calais because of that slowdown. It might change just based on the traffic that uh, Colbert might find himself in coming out of the pits. Uh, he's actually got no traffic around him from what I'm seeing on our timing screens. Yeah, he's uh, he might have s slower traffic, right, lap traffic, right, but right. he doesn't have anyone to do. In fact, as we jump on board with him, oh, perfect. I mean, he is very much having to saw at the wheel under braking, but it's about as clear as you could hope for. We focus back, though, on Juan Malagon, Fernando Yaquez in that spray, riding up to Ascari. You can see the breathing off the throttle, letting the gap grow to the car in front, and then bouncing through the curb. Car gets a bit sideways for Yaquez just in front of us. But this, this is painful. 2.09, 3.24, fastest lap for Fernando Yaquez. Last lap, 2.11, 2.83. And remember, we were doing, what, 1.48 in the dries in the Fix Series. That's crazy to me. I mean, the, the race has um, improved a little bit on, on time. You know, we were running uh, 2.12 in qualifying. Uh, but, and they get more comfortable, right, as... as the race goes on, these drivers, these cars, as we start to see pit stops, Saquez is going into the pits as well as Rich Calais and uh, yeah, Keith Maines coming in as well. So pit stops a plenty here to answer our questions earlier of can they make it? No, but guess where they did end up going? Lap 14, lap 15. So I guess the uh, they didn't really save any. It's kind of what I expected um, them to be going in dry conditions. The word was, by the way, that the last time someone did a no-stop was on the streets of Long Beach. Not a surprise. Now on board with both Calais as well as Colbert. You could see Colbert having to get a bit of opposite lock as he worked it out of the final corner. Where is he going to feed in the blend? Already up to speed. And my goodness, flies on through. You can see... That pit strategy worked a treat for him. Now, can he slow it down in time to get into turn number one? No, he can't. He'll go straight on. He'll not only have to take the chicane, he'll have a slowdown as well. Another driver follows him through. Might have been Cantonio, but all of that hard work done on pit lane and the strategy Three comes drivers. unstuck. Three drivers just had to go through that runoff chicane and will get slowdowns there. Oh, look at that. In the background, we might have another. Uh, I just wonder if they're getting caught out, right? They head into turn one once again, up to speed, full of aggression. And look at that puddle. That's a great shot as in uh, through the second wow. chicane. That was Colbert just holding off Calais. This is great stuff, Dylan. I'm loving it. Still four cars, though, at the front yet to come down pit lane. I wonder, Arjuna, uh, if the sitting in, I mean, these tires... Yes, they're going to be cold no matter what. They're trying to find some traction, some grip, some warmth into the tires by going into the areas of the track that are drier, even though it's all wet, but drier than most. If going into the pits and slowing down for as long as they did, and I'm not saying they uh, had to go into the pits for a very long time, uh, but oh, 30 no. seconds in pit lane, what are you, what are you hearing? No, Boris Savannah's come down pit lane, so any chance of the no-stopper uh, has come to an end. Chase Wilson will follow, and... Logical assumption, Juan Malagon and Abner Acosta going to end up uh, following as well. So, where is that going to leave? Probably not uh -oh. talking too much about your leader. It's more going to be about where Wilson fends on out. Malagon's going to go one lap longer. But there is Yaquez. He's got three seconds back to Rich Calais. And now just waiting to see after Chase Wilson. Lengthy stop for him. What's going on? Oh, goodness. I... I don't know if this is adding more fuel than necessary. 21 seconds in the pit box. That is more time. That's 13 seconds more than most of these drivers are doing. That is detrimental to his race. And there comes Fernando Yaquez and Chase Wilson is going to give up net second on the road after spending almost 13 seconds longer. And there's a Seabow racing car parked in the opening corner. That's Douglas Corey. It's not going to be an issue for these drivers navigating their way through that First uh, right, then left flick as they work through the chicane. Gogo Baldi's got the front end of that Ferrari reattached. As now he's got two and a half seconds up to Carl Colbert and then Rich Calley. I think that's going to be his target. Get to fifth position and grab some needed championship points. Yeah, that is huge. And uh, we haven't really seen much of Baldi in this race so far, but he still has a shot to advance his position a little bit more. Hey, drivers have made mistakes, a ton of them in front of him. And uh, 
you know, we, we, we talked about Juan Malagon being the, uh, the driver that still really needs to get himself down into pit lane, but I wonder how much him being in front of Boris Avando, at least even for this lap and six seconds ahead, kind of plays into it. What's Slow down. Here? Slow down potentially, or are they fighting side by side? Rich Kelly is very oh, no, slow contact. on the inside. There was a slight bit of contact, but I think potentially Calais very slow through that second chicane and still trying to get himself up to speed. Colbert's going to try and take this opportunity to leave Calais to deal with Gurgo Baldy, Keith Maines, and David Mendoza. Five minutes left to go. Time is very much ticking down. Here comes Juan Malagon to pit lane. No one's going to be able to make it on uh, a, a, a tank of fuel from the start. Five minutes will be left to go as Boris Evando hits the line once more. Yeah, five minutes underneath it to go in this race, and there's still a lot to be uh, fought for, especially on the podium steps and the AM class win. I mean, these drivers are racing so close to each other. I'm still shocked at how well Borsavando has uh, handled his race so far and how he's driving in the rain. He got such a big lead from the jump that he just kind of, I don't want to say he's been mailing it in, but he's been mailing it in because he can. Yeah, he's had the ability, right, to basically dictate the tempo and, and do exactly what he needs and wants to do. And not often you get those opportunities, sort of a similar situation that we did uh, have for for Felix Feliz in the in the sprint series a uh, fix series race rather excuse me just uh, by virtue of breaking the toe rather than the the conditions making it so wild 41 started we are going to end up finishing with what will be 27 scored and classified points will probably though be paid down just that little bit lower there is your race leader heading out of the first Lesmo with some traffic in front of him up the road but he's not put a foot wrong just yet not assuming he's going to do it just now yeah, he has not put a single foot wrong. And, uh, of course, they're going to be showing blue flags. If you Can <laughs> can you even see the blue signage uh, t if you're any of the uh, the drivers that are about to go either one lap or another lap down? It's so hard to see anything in front. You'd have to think that they at least know that there's traffic around them. At least in iRacing, you get the blue flag in sim. Right. In the real world, I mean, yeah. you. Gosh. That's where in, the, in these cars you have a lot of those, you know, uh, whatever they're called now. They're not proper screens, they're, but they're LED MFDs. displays. <laughs> Multifunction displays. No, no, they're kind of, but like... Screens. No, no, it's not what's on the on the steering wheel. It's like a dedicated oh. unit that is controlled by race control. Like in, in the World Endurance Championship, Eduardo Freitas has the ability... I'm sure if he wanted to, he could go and draw all sorts of amusing things on, the, on that special <laughs> unit of... Race control indicator. <laughs> exactly. There, there, there you go. It's a race control indicator. But that's, I'm guessing, where the, the blue flags come to. But, you know... I, I guess it's, a, it, it's one of those things where we have it easy in the sim world and they have to build those tools to make it happen in the real world. Now, Boris Evando could slow down, but I think we've got two laps to go because he crossed the line with about two minutes and 30 seconds left on the clock. Yeah, and what happened here? Uh, Tavares, it was going so well. Obviously, he and Abner had their off together fighting for second. And well, that comes at a time where not going to have to look in the rearview mirror too much, but I don't think he's going to have the chance to get back in front. Oh, no. Gurgo Baldy, Rich Calais, I think, as well, into the opening corner of Gone Deep. And that is going to give Carl Colbert the leading class. That's brutal. That is absolutely brutal, but there is just two laps probably to go in this race. So if he can just crawl over the line, he's not going to lose too, too much. The problem for Baldy is that there's so many drivers that are within a couple seconds of him right now. We'll see how much that damage slows him down. I mean, again, the replay will tell us something. Oh, it's Rich Calley behind as well. That's just that little bit deep. It's a small mistake, but... Big consequences this deep for him fighting for point and the class win as well. There's a look at the run out of the, uh, in towards the parabolic, I should say. 18 seconds back from your race leader, Juan Malagon. The best of the Seabow Racing Team entries. There is Boris Evando, who's going to be building this confidence and taking it into VCO Infinity, representing Precision Racing Esports this weekend. Uh, the one thing that I've learned today is if it rains, watch out for Mr. Ovando.
Could you imagine a situation where there's, I don't know, 10 seconds left by the time he's about to cross the line, he does that slow down before, just to make it the last lap? Did you see that a few weeks ago, by the way? At the Nürburgring Life oh, Track and Series. Yeah, and the, it's oh, so goodness. cruel as well because, you know, that driver did everything right except win like it was it was so heartbreaking you can't yep. at the north life you can't afford to do one more lap and so no. you've got to play those games oh it's like the only track that i feel like it makes sense to to slow it down to try and end that lap earlier there le mans there's a few places but you're right it's not <sighs> it's not very often oh man I, I i watched that and i just went man we saw some great racing in the digital nurburgring endurance series over this past winter that uh, took place across four or five different classes, but, you know, that real-world racing, it's just even crazier. You have 150-plus cars, 25, 30 different classes, and they're all still fighting to be the overall champion, and it's not always so cool. the GT3s that, by virtue of the scoring system that takes center stage, and, yeah, my one wish for iRacing, especially now that we've got Rain Dillon, uh, 180 cars at the Nordschleife. Oh, man, that's just so cool to think about. And, uh, hey, one day, that's a bucket list kind of race to go to. That's yeah. A, oh, man. You know the problem that, with it this year, though? Tell me. They, they picked uh -oh. a weekend where there's a lot of racing happening. Oh, no. There's this little thing called the uh, Formula One Monaco Grand Prix. As, oh, no. Oh, no, Chase Wilson. Oh, no. Oh, no. Chase Wilson's <laughs> taking a tow back to pit lane. No. Oh, well, we thought there was really nothing to worry about on this final lap. We thought the drivers had mastered the conditions. Chase Wilson, unfortunately, finds out the hard way. Apparently not. Oh, this, this has been wild. At one point, Wilson was on for a podium. Lengthy pit stop cost him dearly. But out front and sailing clear and in dominant fashion as well. Boris Evando conquers the conditions. Masters the moisture at the Temple of Speed to win in the Precision Racing League. GT3 Sprint Series, a lengthy wait to see the rest of the rivals behind. And while we do so, Dylan, let's go check out, check out rather what happened to Chase Wilson. Oh, that's brutal. But why is he taking a toe if there's, oh man, this is scary. Oh, no, why, why, ah. he just got scared out and he did not want to cause any more drama. He fell on his own sword there. I, listen, in a sport, don't fall on your own sword when you don't have to. There's no contact. I know he's scared. I know he's worried, but that, I don't, uh, I'm not a fan. It's an interesting call. The rest of the drivers will finish things up. No photo finishes to really speak of, by the way, but Carl Colbert is your winner in the AM class. So give him a bit of a shout out for, oh, let's be honest, Dylan, surviving the madness and finishing fourth overall. That was remarkable from Kyle Colbert, but it looked like he made his pit stop when it mattered most, and Rich Calais, remember, had the slowdown from missing the chicane immediately after Colbert uh, decided to go into the pits, and uh, Calais, I guess, couldn't deal with the, uh, the lack of a, a driver to fight in that situation. The rest of the drivers just finish things up, finishing things up here, and uh, still looking forward to the chats that we'll have with the drivers. I think Boris Evando is going to have a story to tell us about uh, not a race, but a drive that he will remember for quite a while. You can see the damage on some of these machines as well. One of the Ferraris missing its entire front end. Good thing that we're in Italy. Not far to get a new front end shipped if you did need to get the spare parts department on the case. Spare parts department department, uh, spare parts department, excuse me, Dylan, probably going to make a pretty decent chunk of change out of this race as well yeah i agree um we're gonna see some wild standings and what they look like when the points are all calculated together uh at the end of the day heading into the circuit de la sarth next week and uh oh gosh i just remembered we're going to le mans next week again what a what a schedule and after le mans we go to seabrain and maybe without rain next week. I think that's what drivers will be hoping for. Not Boris Evando, though. 18 seconds clear. And after breaking away on lap one, never looked back. One Malagon, Fernando Yaquez, Seabell Racing Team, second and third. And then the best of the AMs, Carl Colbert. What a drive from him in his Ferrari to snatch up fourth. Precision Racing, blue and silver, fifth and sixth with Mains in front of Mendoza. And then Kevin Cantonio 
in front of Abner Acosta, Rich Calley, and Emmett Linkfist rounding out your top 10. And a couple of drivers, let's not forget, starting towards the back, along with David Mendoza and Cantonio after struggling in qualifying. Mark andre Garon, 11th for him. The best of the SimCity Racing drivers with Ray Dominguez and then Sean Murphy, Oliver Santos, and Richard Saavedra, 12th through 15th. Diego Morales then finishes as the final driver on the lead lap. Only 16 of the drivers can call that, uh, can say they did that. Chase Wilson, one lap down, along with Miguel Colon, uh, Jeremy Littleton, and then Martin Chris rounding out your top 20. Gogo Baldi, Nane Tavares, and then Chris Long, three laps down before you start to really get into the used car lot. Jason Allen, Devin Brock, Ardy Mercedes, Diego Ere, Douglas Corey, Gonzalo Cortez, and Aiden Young, all within nine laps of your leader. Ethan Bass, 10 laps down, Nesta Santana as well, Luis Grion, Juan Lemus, Miles Brown, Chris Song, Jason Hodgson, uh, Mateus Carvalho, Chris Stewart, and then Jack Hedgecox, all in front of Alex de Almeida, Eric Staropoli, Kevin Simpson, and Andre Bernati. A look top to bottom at the results tells us some, but I don't think it tells us much because up here in the booth, we were shielded from the elements and very much dry and comfortable. Boris Evando had to get very much familiar with the moisture. And well, Boris, you very much got to grips with it very, very quickly. Talk to us about that race and well, an 18 second margin at the end. How comfortable was it really? Uh, it was scary, I'll tell you. I didn't think I was going to reach lap traffic so fast, and just getting by the couple cars that I did was scary. I switched off for a second. The conditions were really, really bad. So, I'm, I'm, but I'm happy. Um, I'm happy with the uh, with the pace. Uh, I guess the lesson learned: don't switch off in the rain conditions. But I think you probably were telling yourself that before you even come here, uh, came here anyway. Uh, Boris, let's talk championship, right? Because I think this is a big swing with Baldy, Cantonio, and Lemus having relative issues you uh, you know missed the first round of the season but second win on a bit of a roll right now how are you feeling about potentially making a championship fight it's it's probably going to come down to how well i can get the porsche around some of the tracks where it's weak here i was pretty strong in the wet but i know that in the dry at lama it's going to be really tough against all the ferraris on track so just have to battle through that and i'm disappointed from for last week i qualified towards the front i, sh I should have finished with a top five and uh i think i got a p15 because of the crash but that's unfortunate got and i uh, battle back gotta ask before i let you go as well vco infinity this weekend how much are you looking forward to f uh wheeling a bunch of different cars do you know what assignments you've already got uh yeah really excited for it actually um it's going to be interesting with the car choices. Uh, last night, we just sat, sat down here on Discord and we're kind of allocating what are we going to do. I think I'm going to be driving the majority MX-5 races. Uh, I haven't driven the MX-5 in a while, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. And then uh, I think I have one GT3 race. So mostly MX-5 and uh, one GT3. And I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. One GT3 race? Who are they putting in instead of you to, to drive the GT3? Come on. Well, we, we have Dom, we have Elliot. They're, they're really strong with the, with the GT3. Uh, and then it's such a popular category that everybody kind of wants to drive that. So kind of divvied it up but evenly. Embarrassment of riches, I think, in some ways. Congratulations, <laughs> Boris, on the victory. And can't wait to see you this weekend and next week as well as we go back racing, this time from the Circuit de la Sar. Thanks, Arjuna. Well, that's a chat with our race winner. Don't know if we're going to get the chance to chat to anyone else from our podium. And so, uh, you know, Dylan, as we wrap up, closing thoughts from this race. I uh, don't even want to look forward to, to next week just yet. I think I'm a bit shell-shocked from what we saw here today. I mean, both races were fantastic for different reasons. In the first race, we had some unbelievable battles, some mistakes made by big names and uh, an Obviously, Felix Feliz came away with his first PRL win. This one, we just saw a master work at his craft with Boris Avando, uh, just absolutely putting the rest of the field to shame with his skills in the wet. But everybody else, I mean, it was chaos. Uh, we, we only saw uh, 20 drivers, uh, or I should say 16 drivers finish on the lead lap. And uh, oh boy, it was it was wild. It was definitely a uh, unique race, and I don't, I'm like you, Arjuna, I'm shell-shocked. I don't really know what to think of it, and I might need this week to digest it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to taking this week away, and I'm assuming it's probably going to be dry when, 
Well, we go racing at, well, the Circuit de la South. We were talking about fuel and, and mileage. That's going to be important when we head here as well. Uh, and, you know, Dylan, it uh, leads us through a stretch of the championship where, you know, we mentioned draft being important as well. But I look at the, the list of tracks that we have this season, and it's basically the who's who of the yep. biggest, the greatest tracks in the world, Sebring, off to the Austrian mountain, down to the mountain for Mount Panorama, and then to the Green Hell. I mean, look at how we're finishing the season off. This is just one of my favorite schedules I think I've seen in recent memory. Uh, across any series, uh, you really are going to the who's who list of the top international tracks. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm personally excited for uh, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sign. I was going to say, like, Seabrae, ah, Red Bull Ring's great. Oh, come on. You can't go wrong with any of them. No, sign us up for all of it. But for now, well, it's time for us to go and gather our emotions and gather our thoughts. The driver is probably going to want to do that as well. I mean, the heavens open at the Temple of Speed, and these shots will tell you all you need to know. That was how this race started. Chaos and carnage, they slipped and uh, slid their way through the grass, but ultimately a deserving weight race winner, Boris Evando, conquering the conditions. Dominant wins across of both of our races tonight. Is it a shift of the momentum in the championship hunt? Well, you have to stick around on RaceBot TV to find out. On behalf of the team behind the scenes for Dylan Cole, joining myself, Arjuna Kenki Party. Thank you so much for joining us. VCO Infinity this weekend. Looking forward to seeing Precision Racing Esports out in action. Can't wait to go racing, though, in a week's time when we make our way to the Circuit de la Sarthe.